Hey guys, this is Take a Chance on Me. It was actually the first book I wrote um, of this series, but because it was originally part of a multi-author set, it had to wait to be released. So it's now the second book in the series, but I think you guys will really enjoy it. So I hope you enjoy listening to it too. See ya! Chapter 1. Katie. Crazy. My friends are crazy. Possibly certifiable. That is the only explanation for the words that just spilled out of their mouths. You want me to do what? I am sure that I have heard them incorrectly, although I probably should have suspected something when they suggested getting dinner in the middle of the week. Generally, we go out on Fridays, but we reserve the other days of the week for important things, like birthdays, promotions, or interventions, which is what this appears to be shaping up to be. Just hear us out, Hannah says, which sends up a major red flag. Hannah is the creative entrepreneur who started her own business, but she's also obsessed with mood and personalities. She's constantly telling us how the colors we see affect the way we feel, and she tries to relate every little flaw we have to some personality trait. I'd say look it up if you don't understand, but really, it's just better to feign understanding and remain ignorant. Her obsession is a little over the top. Of course, she would say that's my microaggression rearing its ugly head. Yes, according to her, people have microaggressions too. Whatever that means. But I'm not sure I buy that. Regardless, Hannah has a very take-charge attitude, and I can see it rearing its ugly head as she glances at Charlie, Piper, and Belle, who nod in return. Remember when we were in high school and we used to make those packs to try new things? Of course, I remember. It would be nearly impossible to forget, especially since one of those packs resulted in all of us dyeing our hair green one year. Our mothers were not pleased, and we were the laughingstock of the school for a week until we all broke down and returned our hair to its natural color. Yeah, but we were in high school. I lift a brow and look at each of them before continuing. In case you missed the last decade, we are now out of high school and college. This is real life. Hannah holds up her hands. I know, but remember how fun it was just to let loose and not worry? With Valentine's Day coming up, I interrupt her with a sigh and a roll of my eyes. I am convinced Valentine's Day is a made-up holiday to make florists, card makers, and chocolatiers money. Actually, Valentine's Day isn't a made-up holiday, although when it was originally introduced, it was much more about getting women pregnant than giving them chocolates and flowers, Piper says, pushing her glasses up her freckled nose. Piper is like a walking encyclopedia and definitely got the best grades of all of us in high school and college. But sometimes her timing is atrocious. What? She shrugs her shoulders. There was a documentary about it on TV last night and I couldn't sleep. Of course there was. Piper is almost always the last one of us to go to sleep. She says it's because her mind refuses to turn off, and I'm tempted to believe her. She has way more going on in her head than I do. It's scary, everything that goes on in there. Anyway, Valentine's Day stinks. That wasn't your view last year, Charlie says. Charlie is the no-nonsense, take-charge one, who I'm pretty sure knows at least three different ways to kill people. She works as a professional trainer, and I'm fairly certain it's because she likes making people feel pain, and it's one of the few professions she can do that without getting thrown in jail. I shoot her a withering look. Last year, my fiancé hadn't just dumped me for one of my friends. Not as good of a friend as I thought, it turned out, but still. Last year, I had a date on Valentine's Day. I received the overpriced flowers that died within a week. 
the delicious chocolate that I rationed for a month so I wouldn't gain too much weight. And I was treated to an overpriced dinner at a fancy restaurant. It looked pretty, but it sure wasn't filling. Still, I wasn't alone like I will be this year. Exactly. Hannah flashes a smile, but it does not give me joy. Instead, it fills me with a sense of dread. But oblivious to my discomfort, she continues. And that's why we came up with this. For the next few weeks, you let the eight ball decide any time someone asks you a question. It decides if you go on a date, if you stay late at work, if you eat Thai food or Mexican. I don't know, guys. I shake my head at the suggestion, and not just because putting my life in the hands of an eight ball is weird, even for my friends. The wound is still pretty fresh. Adam broke up with me just a few months ago, before Christmas, but not before I'd purchased his gift that I'd had to return later. And I'm not sure I'm ready to date again, especially not after hearing he's already engaged again. My whining about his engagement is most likely what caused this friend intervention. Of course, you can set boundaries, Hannah continues, as if she doesn't hear my objection. Like, obviously, you won't do anything illegal or against your morals, but otherwise, she shrugs. You let the eight ball decide and just go with the flow. I watched a documentary on the eight ball once. Did you know it originally started in a tube and then a crystal ball? But it became the eight ball after a billiard company used it for a promotional idea. Not many things that go through three iterations continue to last as long as it has. What's an iteration? Belle asks Piper, her forehead scrunching in confusion. I love Belle, but she's kind of the airhead of the group. She is an actual Southern Belle who still sounds like she just got off the set of Gone with the Wind. And she's about as ditzy as they come. Her blonde hair is more than a perfect color. It's like the punctuation to her ditziness. It's a change. Charlie shoots Piper a reproachful look. Piper just likes to sound smart. I am smart, Piper quips. Oh, well, I think it's a great idea no matter how many alliterations it has, Belle says, turning back to me. Piper rolls her eyes at the word slip, but the rest of us decide to let it go. No one wants to have to explain alliterations to Belle, nor does her liking the idea give me warm fuzzies. After all, she nearly ruined Christmas last year when she thought a killer was after her. In the end, it worked out, but still. Then maybe you should do it, I say back. But going with the flow doesn't sound all bad. Obviously, my taste in men isn't what I thought it was. So maybe letting fate decide isn't such a bad thing. Besides, it's only for a few weeks. How bad could it possibly be? I say we make it a dare. Charlie folds her arms across her chest and arches one eyebrow. Though not bulky, she is definitely jacked, and the muscles in her arms ripple as she flexes. Even so, I shoot her another warning look. She knows I won't turn down a dare. None of us will. One of the stupid packs we made in high school was that we would always accept a dare as long as it wasn't dangerous. The thought at the time was that sometimes we could see what the other people needed when they couldn't, and we could issue dares that would help them get over fears. It was a good idea at the time, but I'm regretting the pact now. I second that. Belle raises her hand as if she thinks this is a democracy. Even though I find dares to be antiquated, I will agree in this circumstance, Piper says. Hannah smiles triumphantly at me. Well, the dare has been issued. What are you going to do now, Katie? I look at each of them and sigh. I should be mad that they've ganged up on me. But honestly, I love these girls like sisters, so I can't stay mad for long. Fine, hand me the eight ball. Yes! 
Hannah pumps her arm and then pulls it from her purse. She doesn't carry an especially large one, so I have no idea how she got it in there. But she's a master at packing, so it shouldn't surprise me. We picked it up specially for you, so it's never even been used before. Well, I'm sure people tried it in the store, but you know what I mean. She hands me the baseball-sized object encased in cardboard. I can't believe you guys. I begin opening the box to pull the ball out. I'm going to look like an idiot doing this. I glance around the restaurant, sure that every eye is watching us right now. But thankfully, I am wrong, and no one seems to be paying us any attention. Belle flicks her hand. Just explain that it was a dare and you couldn't say no. I doubt most people take dares as seriously as we do. I manage to get the rest of the cardboard off and hold the plastic ball in my hand. I have a vague memory of having one of these in middle school, but I have no idea whatever happened to it. Well, shall we put this baby to the challenge? What are you going to ask it? Belle leans forward, her eyes gleaming like it's Christmas, or her birthday, and she's about to open a huge present. She loves birthdays and refuses to celebrate just one day. Instead, she has a birthday week. Am I going to enjoy this challenge? I flip the ball over and, yes, definitely, pops into the viewing screen. I think you may have to take this back. It's broken already. Hannah leans over to read the decision and shoves me. It is not. I think you will enjoy this challenge, and I, for one, will enjoy watching you have to consult it for your decisions. How very optimistic of you. You're just being pessimistic, she shoots back, sticking her tongue out at me. This will be good for you. Ask it if you'll have a date for Valentine's Day this year. Belle says, wiggling in her chair. She's almost like a puppy trying to contain her excitement. Though I'm not sure I want to know the answer to that question, especially since I'm not sure I'm ready to date again, I ask the ball and turn it over, chuckling when my sources say no floats to the top. Maybe it's accurate after all. There certainly aren't any prospects on the horizon. But there could be... Belle says. I bet it changes before the 14th. I guess we'll have to wait and see. I set the ball to the side. Now, can we focus on something other than my love life or lack thereof? The girls agree, and the topic switches to the struggles they've been facing at work. But as the conversation continues, my eyes slide to the magic eight ball. Even though I know it's a gimmicky toy and nothing more, I want to ask it if Adam's happy, if he loves Amy, if he ever loved me. This is going to be a long few weeks. Chapter 2. Derek. Coffee. I smell coffee. The sweet, earthy aroma always invigorates my senses. Wait, why do I smell coffee? I'm supposed to be showered and dressed by the time I smell coffee. My eyes snap open, and I shoot out of bed. I've overslept. Again. What is going on with me? My alarm is set for the same time every day. It goes off like clockwork. I'm like clockwork. Or at least I'm supposed to be. Something's been shifting in the last few weeks, but this is not the day to be late. No, this is the day I need to be at work earlier than normal to show Philip how determined I am, how dependable. Dependable has been my moniker. Dependable Derek. It's not a bad moniker. There are certainly worse things I could be than dependable. Dependable looks good on a resume. It gets you interviews. It generally even results in job offers. But it doesn't grab your attention. It doesn't scream, promote this man. And I should know, because I've been passed over for at least two other promotions. And today is another chance. Maybe the last chance. So today I need stellar, outstanding, perfect. 
But as I survey the contents of my closet, I wonder, which suit screams that? The black pinstriped? The blue pinstriped? The gray pinstriped? Yes, I know they probably look the same to everyone else. But I can see the variations, the subtle differences, and it's enough for me. I just wish I knew which one screamed success to everyone else. With a sigh, I grab the gray pinstriped, hoping it will be enough to push me over the edge. This would be easier with a woman in my life. Yes, women come with their own challenges, and finding one who could put up with my need for routine might be tough. But I know they generally excel in this area and would be handy to have around for times such as these. Normally, a woman is the furthest thing from my mind, as I can take care of myself. I cook. My father taught me that at a young age, though he was disappointed that I didn't excel at cooking like he did. I clean, a wonderful trait passed down from my mother, who always ran her finger along my shelves when she checked my room. I learned, very early, to make sure and clean every surface— and once I learned that lesson, she rarely found a speck of dust. And I'm successful. Mostly. I've been employed by the same company for several years. And while I'm rarely praised, I'm never reprimanded. So my life is on the right track, I think. But this promotion would help solidify the feeling that this is the track I'm supposed to be on. And something tells me the right image could clench the promotion. Image was never my strong suit. In high school, most kids wore jeans with holes in them. I never understood that trend. And ratty t-shirts with some obscure band pictured on them. That was not my style. I was a member of the chess club and the AV team. My clothes were slacks and button-down shirts. On tournament days, I might add a suit jacket for the extra professional touch. I didn't have a lot of friends, but I didn't feel like I needed them either. The two guys I did connect with were enough for me, and they dressed like me. No one at my current job wears holy jeans or ratty t-shirts, thank goodness, but I doubt they notice or appreciate the extra care I take in my appearance. As long as I show up on time, give 110%, and stay longer than everyone else, they're happy. Which I do. Every day. But today is not every day. No, today the boss is announcing who is getting the new promotion, and I'm in the running, but so are others, from what I've been told. My watch beeps, reminding me that my coffee has finished brewing and it is time for breakfast. Giving myself a final glance in the mirror, I adjust my tie one last time. The knot has to be perfectly centered, after all. Wipe the sink with the towel to pick up the few water droplets that escaped my attention after brushing my teeth, and then flick off the light. If I get this promotion, perhaps I can finally get the timer for the lights. Maybe another visual cue will help on the rare days like today when I sleep through my alarm. That and remembering to go to bed at the right time. I knew I shouldn't have stayed up late reading, but the book sucked me in. The subtle aroma of coffee tantalizes both my nose and my stomach as it begins its morning aerobic routine of letting me know it is hungry. Grabbing my freshly washed mug from the dish rack, I fill it with coffee first, then add a splash of milk. I can drink it black, but if I'm at home, I'll add a little milk. I take a satisfying sip and then turn to the task of making my eggs and toast. Some people would find this routine boring but I've learned the value of routines, and I consider eggs to be the breakfast of champions. Not only do they contain many needed vitamins, but you can make them in so many different ways. Fried, scrambled, over easy, sunny side up, you can literally have a different form of egg nearly every day of the week, which decreases the likelihood of boredom occurring. When the eggs are the perfect consistency and color, I'm scrambling them today, and looking for that soft yellow color, and the butter on the toast has melted, leaving a golden sheen. I plate them both and sit down at the small table. I take another sip of coffee as I pull up the daily wordle on my phone and begin working the first level. 
For me, Wordle is like a crossword, only quicker. Don't get me wrong, I love crosswords too. But sometimes they take too long, and I'm forced to leave them incomplete until work is over. I despise leaving things incomplete, so I was delighted when I found Wordles. I can still challenge my brain, but a level generally only takes a few minutes. My record is deducing the correct word in just two tries, though I do think some of that was due to luck. However, five tries is my norm, and today appears to be on par with the norm. After breakfast, I wash the dishes, return them to the drying rack, and wipe down the counter. A spotless kitchen is one worth returning to in the evening, my mother's voice says in my head. Another beep of my watch indicates it is time to go, and I lift my jacket from the coat rack before slipping on my wingtip loafers and grabbing my keys and attaché case, both of which sit on the end table by the door. I spare one final glance at my apartment to make sure everything is in its place, and when I am assured it is, I step outside, locking the door behind me, and cross to my silver Prius. I love the quiet of the Prius. I use the half-hour drive to work to go over my assets for when Philip asks. Number one, I am meticulous. My desk is never messy, unlike some of the other people who work there. Two, I am always on time. Even on rare days like today when I sleep through the first alarm, I have backups set to wake me up. Three, I stay later than almost anyone there. The parking lot is usually empty when I leave. Four, I'm a good communicator. I always have my presentation planned and practiced. Of course, my one flaw is questions. I always try to think of questions that might arise, but if someone asks something I haven't thought of, it stumps me for a bit. However, I would wager that the rest of the people up for this promotion have bigger flaws than that. As I pull into the parking lot, I can feel my heart rate increasing. I do have a small case of anxiety when it comes to anything I can't plan, but I've worked hard to manage it. Five deep breaths and a few affirmations usually does the trick. This time it takes ten, but finally my heart rate is back to normal. I exit the car and head toward the entrance. Be friendly, engaging, smile at people. I tell myself, if I can accomplish those things, my impeccable record should be enough to push me over the others and to the promotion. Good morning, Shelley, I say to the receptionist as I pass. I've noticed that most people pass her desk without a word, and while I know she has no say in who gets the promotion, I have no idea when Philip or the other bosses might be watching, so I've been working on greeting her each day since the promotion was announced. She smiles up at me. Good morning, Mr. Davis. Today's the day, right? Indeed it is, and I feel good about this one. In reality, my stomach feels a little more like I just got off a roller coaster, but mind over matter. Good luck, she says as I continue toward the elevator. I punch the elevator button and check my watch. Ten minutes to spare. It's not as much time as I would like, but I did have to spend a few more minutes on breathing exercises this morning, so it can't be helped. Still, it is an acceptable time to arrive. Finally, the bell chimes, and the soft hiss of the elevator door sliding open reaches my ears. As soon as they are open, I step in and begin pressing the button for my floor. The fourth floor. But before the doors close, a voice says, Hold the elevator! And then a woman slides inside. Didn't you hear me say hold the elevator? She enters with her head down, but when she lifts her gaze, the smile on her face literally falls off when she recognizes me. Oh, sorry. I should be offended, but honestly, I feel the same way. Crazy Katie, I know the letters don't match, but the alliteration is still there, is one of the few people who nearly makes me break out in hives. She is the opposite of order. She's almost always late, her desk is a cluttered mess, and I hear her talk about dares she does with her friends. I never participated in truth or dare, but I would think even those who had would outgrow it by the time they're nearing 30. 
not Katie, apparently. Time seems to slow down as the elevator lifts, and I know I should say something, but what can I possibly say to her? We orbit in completely different paths, and I'm fairly certain the only thing we have in common is the air that we breathe. Finally, the doors open, and Katie steps out first. I try not to exhale a sigh of relief, at least not loud enough that she can hear me, but then I see her heading for the conference room. No, this cannot be happening. She cannot be up for the same promotion I am. How is that even possible? Now my heart rate is pounding off the charts. A bead of sweat has trickled down my back, and I swear I'm emitting some sort of odor, even though I took a very thorough shower this morning and applied the exact right amount of deodorant. Seven swipes under each arm. I don't believe in gods, lowercase and plural, but if I did, I would swear they hate me right about now. Before the conference door can close, I slip in behind Katie and take a seat at the nearly full table. Evidently, Katie is not the only competition. There are four other people from our department seated around the table. Are we all in the running for the promotion? I had heard the bosses were looking at multiple people, but six people feels like they didn't narrow it down at all. Of course, as I look around, I realize we all have different strengths. What exactly are they looking for in this promotion? Ah, good. Everyone made it. Philip, the boss we report to, and the only one we ever see, breezes into the room. Even though he's in charge, he doesn't dress as professionally as I do. His blue shirt has no buttons, or even a collar and his khaki slacks look like they could use a press. I've never seen him wear them, but I imagine Philip in Hawaiian shirts and cargo shorts outside of work. There is a beachy, laid-back attitude that clings to him, even through work clothes. Today his blonde hair looks a little lighter, and if I didn't know better, I'd say his skin is a little more tan than it was a week ago at our meeting. Did he take a mini-vacation that I missed? or has he just been tanning outside? That seems unlikely, as it's February, but I would put nothing past him. What are we all doing here, Philip? Mark asks. I consider him my biggest competition. Though not as punctual and efficient as I am, Mark is handsome and friendly and often has women fawning all over him. Charisma just seems to drip from him and obey his every command if his perfectly coiffed hair and white teeth are any indication. We're not all up for the same promotion, are we? There is a hint of disdain in his voice as he looks around the table. Actually, you are, but I couldn't decide which of you to hire, so I thought we'd have a little competition. Philip clasps his hands in front of him and smiles out at us, as if we're supposed to find this fun. And maybe some of the others will but my stomach is already bunching. I was never good at competitions unless it was something I could study for, and I doubt this is. What kind of competition? Katie pushes a strand of unruly hair behind her ear with a shaky hand. Interesting. She looks a little nervous as well. Though I didn't think it was possible, Philip's smile grows wider as he stares out at us. We have a client looking to create an app of fun things to do in the city. You are going to partner up and decide which places should appear in the app. It would also be encouraged to find some fun activity that the company could use. Partners? My stomach drops to the floor. I can't do partners. I work better alone, unless I'm working with someone much like me. And as I scan the people in this room, I realize... None of them are like me, and I really can't work with any of them. Is there a chance we could do this on our own? I hope I sound more confident than I feel. Philip flashes a condescending smile at me, and the urge to slide under the table consumes me. I should have just kept my mouth shut. Afraid not, I have already decided on the teams, and I will be choosing one winner from the winning team. Darla, the pretty girl of the office, raises her hand, 
Her face is scrunched in confusion. So, were teammates and competitors? Exactly. His head bounces like one of those bobbleheads people used to have in their cars. I never understood that trend either, or the swaying hula dancer. Both seemed tacky to me. You'll have to help each other to make it to the top, and then I'll be able to tell who is most deserving. The way he rubs his hands together and looks at us makes me feel more like he's plotting who to devour first, instead of who to promote. I glance around the table again, wondering who he's paired me up with. Darla wouldn't be great. She's pretty, with her long dark hair and green eyes, but she's not the brightest tool in the shed. Mark and I have never gotten along, and I'm fairly certain he would throw me under the bus, the first opportunity he got. Harvey has this bad habit of chewing loudly. Derek, you'll be with Katie. Harvey with Angela. Katie? Did he say Katie? I can't be with Katie. She has no structure. She thrives on chaos. Her desk literally looks like a volcano erupted on it. I cannot work with Katie. But of course, I say none of this out loud. Nope, only in my head am I this boldly loquacious. Before I can even open my mouth, not that anything would actually come out, Philip ends the meeting and the others exit the room. I'm left, staring at the table and wondering how this day turned upside down so quickly. Katie sticks her head back in the room. Are you coming? We should probably start brainstorming. Right, I'll be there in a second. I push back from the table, but I don't follow Katie to the common office area. Instead, I turn toward Philip's office. Surely, there has been some sort of mistake, something that we can remedy. Philip looks up as I knock on the doorframe. Derek, how did I know I'd be seeing you? I'm sorry, sir. It's just that I can't work with Katie. And why not? He leans back in his chair and folds his arms across his chest. He's not that much bigger than me, but he certainly manages to seem that way when he wants to. We're just too different. She's cluttered and spontaneous, and I like to plan things out. And that is exactly why the two of you were paired together, he says, leaning forward. Look, Derek, you're a great employee, and maybe you are even the best at putting a presentation together, but connecting with the clients isn't your strong suit. Katie is a little less organized up front, but she is amazing with clients. I put the two of you together so you could learn from each other and get better. I want to argue with him, but logically, what he is saying is correct. I have no doubt that Katie could learn a thing or two from my organization. But what am I supposed to learn from her? I just don't have that laid-back, carefree gene in my body, which is probably why I open my mouth and say, But I made a presentation of my strengths. Philip chuckles and shakes his head. I'm sure you did but I'm not going to look at it. You work with Katie and prove to me you can handle all the aspects of the job, the known and the unknown. With a sigh, I nod and exit his office. Maybe I'm blowing this out of proportion. It's just brainstorming, coming up with ideas, jotting a few things on paper, maybe visiting a few places. How hard could it be? Chapter 3 Katie. With a dramatic sigh, I drop onto the couch. Do you guys have any idea what you've done to me? We haven't done anything to you, Belle says, sitting next to me. What are you talking about? I pull the eight ball from my bag. This. I'm talking about this. I'm up for a huge promotion at my job, and I have to pair up with this guy to create an app. How can I do my best work if I'm having to ask this thing for every move? Ooh, there's a guy. Hannah sits down on the opposite couch and leans forward. Tell me what he's like and I'll tell you if you guys will work well together. I don't know. He's quiet, doesn't talk much, kind of stiff. He always wears a suit, even on casual Fridays, 
and I'm pretty sure he schedules everything, including bathroom breaks. I don't actually know that last part, but I did catch him one day looking at the bathroom with a longing expression and then down to his watch. He did it like five times before he sighed and finally went to the bathroom, so I don't think I'm too off base in that guess. Oh, he sounds rigid. She draws out the words, and there's a tone in her voice like she's pitying me. Or him? It's really hard to say. Whatever that means. It's a really big promotion, though, so I have to do it. And I could use the money. I'm not the kind who goes through money like candy, but things have been tighter recently, and I could definitely use a little breathing room. Can you work with him? Charlie asks. That's really the only thing that matters. Work with him long enough to win, and then show the boss why you're the better option. My nose scrunches as I think about it. Derek is different, but there are worse people I could have been paired with. I mean, I don't hate the guy. He's a little odd, but it could be worse. At least he's punctual and hardworking, and he doesn't smell. I think about the other options. Mark would have been worse. His ego is so big that I don't know how he fits in his office most days. And while he's nice to look at, I'm not sure what else he has to offer. Harry Harvey was also a contender, and that would have been awkward with a capital A, considering he's asked me out more times than I can count. Ditsy Darla would have driven me bonkers. I know Belle is ditzy too, but it's different. I've known her longer, and she's smart about most things. Sometimes. Anyway, it's different. So yeah, it could have been worse. But I still have no idea if Derek and I will be able to work together, especially with the eight ball playing into the picture. I have a feeling he's not going to be sold on that idea at all. Well, then I think you should do it, Belle says, especially if it's the only way to be a contender for the promotion. You'll never get ahead if you don't throw your hat in the game. She looks over at me and her brow furrows. Even though you don't wear hats, but you know what I mean. Yeah, maybe. I don't know why this decision seems hard. Yes, it means working with Derek but it also means going out into the city and experiencing things, which is fun. I just didn't think I'd have to use it for serious stuff like this. What I want to eat for dinner and whether I should go to the gym or not are pretty harmless. This is way more important. Charlie shakes her head and rolls her eyes. I can't believe going to the gym is even a choice. But you agreed to the dare, and you know what happens if you break it. Oh, I definitely know. Back in high school, Belle broke a dare, and we made her life miserable for a week. She had to drive to every event and pick up the check whenever we went out. I don't have the time or money to do that, and now that we are older, I'm sure the punishment would be much worse. I'm not planning on breaking it. I just wish it weren't this month. Well, you could always ask the ball if the experience will be as bad as you think, Belle says with a shrug. Maybe it'll say it's going to be great. That's not really the way it works, but I suppose I can ask a few questions. I lean down and grab my bag from the floor beside me. Then I pull out the magic eight ball and turn it over in my hands. What do you think I should ask first? Ask it if you'll fall in love with the guy. Belle claps her hands together and bounces on the couch next to me. What? No, I am definitely not falling in love with Derek. I almost laugh at the thought of Derek and I together. We'd be like oil and water, black and white, light and dark. We would never work. Of course, Belle and her boyfriend Jackson were like that when they first met, too, but Derek and I are different. How about you ask it if you and Derek will win, Hannah says pragmatically. 
you do realize that whatever answer it gives, it will statistically be only 50% correct, right? Piper looks at us as if we've lost our minds, which earns a chuckle from us and lightens the mood. Yes, Piper, we know, but where's the fun in not asking? Maybe they should have saved the eight ball for Piper. She definitely could use some going with the flow. She shakes her head, but motions for me to continue. Okay, will Derek and I be able to work together? I ask, before turning the ball over. Yes, pops so quickly into the window that I almost wonder again if it's broken. Usually, it takes a bit to get the triangle in the window correctly. Well, it seems confident. Why don't you ask if you'll win, Charlie suggests. Of course, Charlie would be thinking about winning. She is definitely the most competitive one of us. Will I win? I ask and turn the ball over again. This time, the triangle seems to take forever to land in the window, and when it does, the words cannot predict now appear on the screen. Well, I guess it's not so sure about that. Don't worry, I have faith you can win, Charlie says. Me too, Bell adds. Your odds really aren't that great, Piper says, but I believe in you. Just watch out for his one tendencies, Hannah says, even though I have no idea what one tendencies even are. My friends might be a little crazy, but I wouldn't trade them for the world. Chapter 4 Derek I have never dreaded work as much as I do today. Brainstorming with Katie yesterday was like trying to hurt a squirrel. Every time I thought we agreed on something, she would throw down ideas in a completely different direction. I had to take Tylenol when I got home last night to temper the migraine pulsing in my head. When it finally calmed down, I made a list. I spent hours researching different activities in our town. Then I categorized and mapped them so we could stop by them in an orderly fashion and save time. However, as I stare at the list today, it just seems overwhelming, especially considering we only have two weeks to get this done. How on earth will we be able to go to all these places in two weeks? Did you pick a place yet? Katie scoots her chair close to me, invading my personal space. Some floral scent accosts my nose, and I wonder if it's her shampoo or body wash. Mine simply smells clean, although it has a picture of the ocean on it. I had to perform a sniff check in the store before buying it, because the actual ocean smells like salt and fish, and I didn't want that to be my aroma. Thankfully, the image was meant to be metaphorical and not literal, but Katie's scent is definitely not ocean and the sweetness of it tickles my nose slightly. It's not entirely unpleasant, which I find disconcerting. I glance up at her, hoping she will read how uncomfortable she is making me and back up a little, but she appears oblivious. Or she's ignoring my discomfort, which makes me even more uncomfortable. I have made a list of the places I think will be the best. A list? She shakes her head as she cuts me off. We don't need a list. We need to experience. Her hands flare out at the word experience like she is putting it in lights or something. I grit my teeth and try not to lose my cool. But a list makes that process more organized. I can't believe I'm having to explain this. I think we should start with the Museum of Art. It is a cultured place where people can find interesting art and historical relevance. And I just fell asleep. She rolls her eyes. Look, I probably should have said something yesterday, but we're going to have to run every decision past this guy. She opens her bag and pulls out a black billiard ball. Only it looks larger than an actual billiard ball. What is that? I ask, quite sure that I am not going to like her answer. 
She looks at me as if I've grown another head. It's a magic eight ball. Haven't you ever seen one before? No. What does it do? Her nose wrinkles as her eyes shift to the side. Ah, well, that's the tricky part. You ask it yes or no questions and then turn it over. The answer appears in this little screen. Normally, it's just for fun, but my friends dared me to use it for every decision until Valentine's Day. My eyebrows inch up my forehead. Are you saying that you're going to consult that toy for every decision and then follow what it says? I knew Katie was crazy, but I am certain I must have heard her wrong. No grown adult would be silly enough to do this, would they? A light pink blooms on her cheeks and she chews on her lip. Well, yeah, I accepted the dare. I have so many issues with that statement. But what she does is not my concern. At least, it shouldn't be. But I didn't. She grimaces and mashes her lips together. Yeah, sorry about that. I didn't know I'd have to be working with someone when I accepted the dare. But hey, at least it will make this more fun. And if it makes you feel better, the ball thinks we'll win. It doesn't make me feel better. I can feel the headache returning, and I begin massaging my temples to keep it at bay. A child's toy cannot make our decisions. This promotion is important to me. It's important to me, too. Don't worry. I don't think it'll be as bad as you think. I've never had the urge to bang my head against the wall, but I certainly do now. People only say it won't be as bad as you think when they know it will be worse. So you think we should go to the museum, and I think we should go to this really cool artsy place called the Painted Plate. We'll let the ball decide where we go first. Before I can answer, she is waving her hands over the ball and asking, should we go to the stuffy museum? When she flips it over, I find myself craning to see the answer. Why do I care? This is not how rational decisions are made. My sources say no. She turns the ball so I can see, and an annoyance I did not expect stirs within me. How about we go to the painted plate? She turns the ball over once more, and a smile lights up her face as she turns it toward me again. Without a doubt. Guess that settles it. Painted plate, here we come. Do you want to drive, or shall I? I've heard of the painted plate. It even made it on my list, though much further down, but I've never been there. Still, while I will never say so aloud, it does sound like an interesting experience. Not as much fun as a day at the museum, but interesting nonetheless. I'll drive. I don't love having people in my car, and especially not Katie. I'm already imagining her spilling something sticky or leaving muddy prints, but there's no way I'm trusting her behind the wheel of a vehicle. What if she had to consult the eight ball before stopping at a red light or changing lanes? Suit yourself, she says with a shrug. Let's get going. Maybe we can do this and then grab a bite to eat. Restaurants have to be included too, right? Restaurants? I hadn't even considered that eateries might have to be included, but it would make sense. If a tourist comes to town, he or she will have to eat. Great. More work to be done. She punches the button for the elevator, but I shake my head. If I'm going to be eating at restaurants where I don't always have control over the food, then I'm going to find other ways to burn the calories I'll probably eat. I think we should take the stairs. Exercise is good for the body. Wrinkles erupt on her forehead as her face scrunches. Yeah, I am so not taking the stairs. We're four floors up. That is what elevators were made for. She is so frustrating, but I take a deep breath to keep from lashing out at her. Taking the stairs will allow us to burn more calories before we eat who knows what. She folds her arms and lifts her chin so she's looking up at me. The elevator is faster and you take it every morning. 
That's because I generally plan what I'm going to eat and know how much exercise to put into my day. If I'm going to be eating at new places, I will need to up my exercise regimen. She sighs. You sound like my friend Charlie. A few weeks of eating more calories than normal isn't going to kill you. Plus, we'll be walking more once we get downtown. And you do want to have time to visit the rest of your list, don't you? She puts the word list in air quotes and adds a little sass to it as well. My eye twitches as I glare at her. It's the slightest twitch and something that rarely happens, but it tends to rear its head when I'm annoyed, and she is definitely punching my buttons today. This is going to be a long two weeks if every decision is like this. How about we ask the eight ball? She pulls it from her bag and smiles up at me, batting her lashes as if that's going to convince me. That is not how rational people make decisions. My words resemble a growl more than speech as they rumble out of my chest. But it's a lot more fun. So should we take the stairs? She turns the ball over. Cannot predict now. Ask again later. That's not a no, I say. It's not a yes either. Should we take the elevator? She flips the ball again. Yes. Ha, you can't get much clearer than that. I shake my head as she punches the button for the elevator again. It doesn't usually take this long to arrive. There aren't that many floors in this building, although we are near the top. Fine. I'll just add something athletic to the list. Perhaps we'll rent a bicycle and go riding through downtown. Or maybe a nice five-mile walk along the beach would be good. The ding sounds and the doors slide open. Sure, we can do all of that, if the eight ball says so. I am not consulting that toy for everything we do, I grumble as we step into the elevator. You really need to lighten up a little. Have a little fun. She punches the number for the bottom floor. Fun can have consequences. So can being a bore, she says as the doors whoosh closed. I am not a bore, but I don't dignify her statement with a response. We clearly have different definitions of the word fun, so there's no need to argue about it. The soft hum of the machinery fills the air as the elevator moves. Above us, numbers light up and then go dark as we pass each floor. There is something oddly calming about the lights and the soft clicks as the numbers change. And then there is a jolt, and I fall back against the wall. The lights go off. All of them. A moment later, they return, but not nearly as bright as before. What's wrong? Did we just stop? I ask, punching the buttons that are no longer lighting up. Yeah, but I'm sure it's nothing. She at least has the decency to sound apologetic. Probably a power outage, and once it gets back on, then everything will be fine. No, it will not be fine. We could be stuck in here all day. What if they don't even know we are in here? I'm not panicking exactly, but my voice is rising in pitch, and my words are tumbling out faster than before. My heartbeat also seems to be beating a little faster and more erratically in my chest. We won't be stuck in here all day. I'm sure they have cameras in the elevator. They'll see us. Besides, almost everyone uses the elevator. Someone is bound to notice it stopped and come get us. There are no cameras in this elevator. The building is too old for that. Oh, this is your fault. I turn and glare at her as I slide to the floor. My fault? How is it my fault that the elevator broke? It's your fault because you had to consult that stupid toy. What is with that thing anyway? It's fun, she says through clenched teeth. You find being stuck in an elevator fun? Not with you. I'm sure she meant the words to be softer, but they cut just the same. Her expression shifts. I'm sorry, but look, it's not that bad. She rummages in her bag as she sits next to me. 
I have some food and water so we won't starve or die of thirst, and I've got paper and pins. We can play hangman or something. I don't play hangman. I fold my arms across my chest, even though I fully realize it makes me look like a petulant child. In fact, I do like hangman. It's a lot like Wordle, but I refuse to give her the satisfaction. Then draw something. She says it like she's talking to a bratty sibling, complete with a huff and an eye roll, but she holds out a notebook and pen. I'm tempted to say no again, even though drawing will probably help. Doodling in class certainly helped me through high school, so I reluctantly take the proffered gifts. Why do you carry a notebook around with you? Because sometimes inspiration strikes and I don't have my laptop with me, or it's dead because I forgot to charge it. But I do have time to jot something down. Plus, writing on paper makes your brain work better. At least that's what my friend Piper says. For a brief second, I think about asking her about her friends, but I'm still a little annoyed that we didn't just take the stairs. I don't like situations I can't control, and I really don't like confined small spaces. So I say nothing. Instead, I drop my eyes to the paper and let the pen move back and forth. I have no idea what I'm drawing, but the rhythmic motions do seem to be controlling my heart rate. That and the affirmations I am repeating in my head. Actually, they're less affirmation and more one statement over and over again. You will not die in this elevator. Not with her. There's actually been studies on that, you know, she continues. And I wonder if she's talking just to fill the silence. That sometimes just the act of holding a pen or pencil helps with ideas. Piper watched a documentary on it and told us all about it. She watches a lot of documentaries. Hannah says it's because of her social issues. This makes me look up. Her what? A blush steals across Katie's cheeks, and for a second I think she could be cute, if she wasn't so frustrating. Never mind. Anyway, sometimes I think we've forgotten about the simple things that worked for so long. I think about telling her I know about social issues, but I'm not sure where that conversation might lead, so I stick to the safer topic. Are you saying you wish technology didn't exist? I don't look up as I pose the question, but when the silence stretches out, I glance at her. Her expression seems stuck between doubt and agreement. I don't know. I think it has its good points and its bad ones. What about you? Technology keeps me organized, so it has its uses. Plus, I think we might be out of a job without technology. You wouldn't be organized without it? I pause, realizing what I said. I don't really remember a time when I wasn't structured and organized, except for right before the accident. But I do know that was when I pushed away any lack of structure. If I didn't do anything spontaneous, there would be less chance of an accident occurring. At least that's what I told myself. But I wasn't sharing that with Katie. I simply said it helps. She looks at me for a moment, as if debating whether to push the issue. I let out a tiny sigh of relief when she veers the subject away from me and back to the original issue. I think structure is okay, but not when it's so strict that it causes you to miss out on the spontaneous gifts of life. You mean like being trapped in an elevator with a co-worker? I meant it sarcastically, but the corners of her lip twitch. Maybe. Or like making someone's day with a smile or a gift. If you plan that stuff out, then it doesn't feel as genuine. I open my mouth to respond, but at that moment the lights become brighter and the car starts moving again. Thank goodness. See, I told you we wouldn't be stuck here forever. We take the stairs from now on, I say, fixing her with a death stare. Then I tear the paper out of the notebook fold it and shove it in my pocket, before handing the notebook and pen back to her. Her eyes linger on my pocket as she takes the items, and I can tell she wants to ask what I drew, but she doesn't. I wouldn't have shown her anyway. 
The elevator reaches the ground level, and the doors whoosh open. I lead the way to my car, hoping that our excitement quota is filled for the day. This is a nice car, Katie says as we approach my Prius. Did you get it because it's electric, or... She lets the question fade into the air, and I wonder what she planned to follow it with. I purchased it for numerous reasons. It does save money on gas being a hybrid. I can charge it for short distances and use gas for longer drives, or when a charging station can't be found. There was also a tax break given with it, and it's quiet. You do seem to appreciate the quiet, she says softly, as she opens the passenger door and slides in. If only she appreciated it more, I think to myself, as I take my seat behind the wheel. But I keep that thought to myself. Working with her is imperative for the next few weeks, and there is no reason to strain our relationship more than it already is. The painted plate is situated downtown, snuggled between a coffee shop that never seems to have a lull, and a clothing boutique that never seems to have a customer. How it manages to stay in business, I don't know. Maybe it does a lot of online sales. Thankfully, as it's early, the traffic downtown is light, and I am able to find a decent parking spot without too much effort. I enjoy the feeling of downtown, but I abhor the parking situation. Parallel parking could be uniform and orderly, but too many people don't know how to park in this town, and it ends up feeling like I'm one of Cinderella's stepsisters, trying to shove a foot that is too big into a glass slipper. This whole ordeal leaves me annoyed and feeling like a toy wound too tightly most days. Today is not one of those days. A tiny bell jingles above the door, announcing our arrival as we enter, and a woman with frizzy red hair, bright green eyes, and some sort of colorful outfit that resembles a moo-moo glances up at us. Welcome to the painted plate. Are you here to paint? The woman's voice is pleasant, but as exaggerated as her outfit, and I force myself not to shrink back. I shake my head at her question of the obvious. What else could we possibly be doing in the shop that looks very much like an artist's studio? Plates of various colors and patterns hang on the walls, surrounded by murals, and the only tables in the room appear to be covered in dry paint that would probably take years to chip off unless she's running some secret taboo business that requires a code word to enter, painting looks like all we can do. We are, Katie answers. We've never been, but we hear it is a fantastic experience. My head jerks at her use of the word we. It is true that I've never been here, but the use of the word we implies that we are together, and we most certainly are not. Wonderful. My name is Leslie, and I will be happy to assist you. Are you doing the couple's paint? Her eyes shift from Katie to me, obviously trying to figure out how we ended up together. Even strangers pick up on how different we are. No, we're not a couple. I have no idea what the couple's paint is, but I'm imagining a scene similar to the pottery one from Ghost and I want none of it. Leslie clasps her hands together and nods. Ah, that makes sense. Well, then individual plates it will be. She crosses to a shelving unit and grabs two plain white ceramic plates from it, holding one to each of us. Every plate is a blank canvas just waiting for inspiration to strike. You can sit here. She leads us to one of the tables and motions for us to sit down. Brushes are in the middle, and paint is on the ends. Paint whatever you would like, but if you get stuck, we also have some pictures that you could look at for assistance. She pats a few books that sit at the other end of the table. Awesome. Thank you. Katie grabs a brush and begins opening the cans of paint. What are you going to paint? I ask. My mind is completely blank. A plain white plate is so useful that I can't imagine putting anything on it. Currently, it goes with everything, 
but painting it will make it so that it only goes with certain things. Of course, unless they do something to seal the paint on the plate, I can't imagine actually eating on it. Not only might it be a health risk, but washing it would wear the paint away. Perhaps it's only meant to be decorative, though I'm not sure why anyone would want to hang a plate. She grins up at me. I have no idea. That's the fun of it. That does not sound fun to me. But I keep that thought to myself as well, and watch as she begins to draw hearts around the edge of her plate. There is a twist to her lips that is not quite a smile, but for some reason I find interesting. And for a second, I wish I could be in her brain to see what she's thinking. Then I realize what a terrible idea that would be. Her brain is probably such a chaotic mess that it would leave me curled up in a corner, rocking back and forth and staring at the padded walls. That might be a bit of an exaggeration, but not much. Shaking my head, I reach for one of the books. Perhaps there is a nice landscape that I could emulate. If I pull in gray and blue, it could even work in my kitchen. As I flip through the pictures, I imagine my kitchen with its gray speckled ceramic tiles, stainless steel appliances, and light gray countertops complete with a blue vein. An image of a ship at sea catches my eye, and I pause. Could I paint that? I have never painted outside of requirements for art class in high school, due to the messiness of it, but I used to enjoy sketching and doodling when instructors got too long-winded. I realize I haven't done that since college, and wonder why I stopped. Opening the bottle of gray, I select a brush and tilt my head, as I try to decide how best to start. Before I know it, the brush is sliding across the plate, leaving trails of color in all the right places. When the gray is complete, I clean the brush and select a blue to complement the gray. The sky begins to take shape, and then the water. I don't enjoy the water, at least not most of it. The quiet stillness of a lake, I don't mind. Nor does the soft trickle of a small river annoy me, but an ocean is another matter. Not only is the sand a nuisance as it sticks to your feet and clothes like Velcro, but the unpredictable nature of the ocean is enough to deter me every time. Anything that can shift from a peaceful lapping of waves to a fierce and destructive storm in an instant is something I want none of. And there's the smell. Wow, you're really talented. Katie's voice reorients me in the present, and I glance down at my plate. While no masterpiece, it does appear skillfully done and surprise floods me at how calm and felicitous I feel. Thank you. When I glance up at her, she is gazing at me with a look of... wonder? Curiosity? I can't quite place the emotion she feels because the small dab of paint on her chin is garnering my attention. How on earth did she get paint on her chin? But when my eyes stray to her plate, I know. It is a cacophony of colors and shapes, and the dizzying feeling after disembarking from a roller coaster floods me. What is it? she asks. I blink and drag my eyes back to her face. You have a spot of paint on your chin. Here? She rubs the opposite side, and I shake my head. No, the other side. I indicate with my finger but when she misses the spot again, I reach out and wipe it away. What on earth? Why did I just do that? She is staring at me, her brown eyes wide beneath her bangs. But my eyes drop to my hand. Not only did I touch her face, but I transferred the paint to my hand. Of course, my hand is washable, but it's the act itself, along with the funny sensation that is bubbling within my chest that is throwing me for a loop. Thank you, she says, and my eyes flick back to her face. There is a confused expression residing there that I imagine is mirrored on my own countenance. You're welcome. And then because I don't know what else to say, I stand and walk to the sink to wash my hands, hoping that the weird connection that was transferring between us a moment ago will have dissipated into the air when I return. 
Perhaps Katie is a bit of a mind reader, because when I return to the table, she says, So, the plates appear to be a success, but what can we have them do for an activity? At a loss for words, something that rarely happens to me, I blink at her for a moment, sure that I look rather like a fish. Isn't the painting of the plate the activity? Perhaps I'm just misunderstanding what she's asking. Yes, it is, but remember there's supposed to be something to encourage them to come here. She taps her lips with her fingers, still covered in dried paint, and then her whole body brightens like a flower in bloom. I know. What if we have a scavenger hunt motif? For each place we put in the app, there could be something they have to do or find and take a picture of it. Like here, they would have to paint a symbol they're given somewhere on the plate, and then they upload the picture to a centralized social media account. The symbol could change every month, and we could have drawings from everyone who does the activities. I blink a few more times as my mind runs through the possibilities. That's actually a great idea. We could even ask the businesses to chip in prizes like coupons. That would not only encourage new users, but would be an incentive for previous visitors to return. A huge grin rips across her face as she jumps from her chair. And for a second, I think she is about to hug me. Her arms fly up as if they're about to encircle me, and I stand, frozen, unsure of what to do. The realization of her almost action dawns on her face just as quickly, and her arms fall to her side as an embarrassed pink tint spreads across her face. I think that's brilliant, Derek. Let's start with ours. What symbol could we add? I look at my plate, which is perfect in my opinion, and I can feel my forehead scrunching as I try to figure out what symbol could be added without destroying the symmetry of the piece. How about a crescent moon, Katie says, and the softness in her voice surprises me. Once again, it's like she's reading my mind, or my body language, and the realization surfaces once more that this is a skill in which I am less adept. I offer a small smile, relieved that a moon is something I can add that will not destroy my picture. I think a moon is doable. We each grab a paintbrush and some white paint, and add the detail to our plates. This is perfect, Katie says. Now we just need to take a picture. Here, you hold yours and I'll take your picture, and then you can take a picture of me with mine. Before I can argue, she is shoving my plate in my hands, lifting her phone, and telling me to smile. My face moves, but I can only hope it is displaying a smile. I don't really enjoy selfies. I don't even have a social media account, because the only people I really talk to are Tommy and Edith, and I can call them. Got it, she says, lowering the camera. You know, you have a nice smile. You should try using it more often. Before I can respond, she is picking up her plate and saying, Okay, now me. I set my plate down and retrieve my phone. Does she actually expect me to take her picture with my phone? as she has yet to offer her own and is currently modeling her plate and smiling at me, I assume that she does. There aren't many pictures on my phone, and I certainly don't want a ton of her cluttering up my storage. But surely I can delete it as soon as we upload it to whatever media account she creates. Okay, got it. Perfect. Let's go tell Leslie our plan and find out what she'd be willing to offer. As she hurries off to find the owner, I feel like I've just wrestled with a tornado, but I have no idea if I've won or lost. Chapter 5 Elation. It is pure elation I am feeling as we leave the painted plate. Not only do I have a cool new plate that Leslie gave us for free in exchange for the advertising we're about to give her store, but she agreed to participate in the scavenger hunt app and offer a buy one get one free incentive to anyone who shows up. That was awesome. If we keep this up, I am positive we will beat out the other competition. You might be right, 
Derek says with a small nod as he unlocks the car. But then what? We're still competing with each other. Like a popped balloon, my elation vanishes. Why does he have to be such a buzzkill? Let's worry about that when we get there, okay? We still have to find more amazing places to add to the app. Speaking of which, let's just walk and see what we find. That's not going to be the fastest way, he begins, but I cut him off. No, but we might miss something if we don't. Just this street, okay? A sigh that could shake an entire room escapes his mouth, but he nods and locks the car again. Then we set off down the street. Oh, that would be perfect, I say, pointing to a building on the right. An escape room is the perfect draw for tourists. What is an escape room? He asks, the color draining from his face. Seriously? Do you watch the news? Escape rooms are all the rage. It's a room with puzzles and clues that you have to figure out in order to escape. So they lock you in a room? His reaction is puzzling. I would have thought he would enjoy puzzles, but he looks like he'd rather sit through a Spice Girls concert. Yeah, hence the escape part. What if you don't succeed? His voice sounds pinched, and he pulls at his collar as he speaks, as if it's trying to strangle him. I shrug. It's usually a timed thing, so if you don't figure it out in the allotted time, then they kick you out of the room with a better luck next time pat on the back. The color returns to his face. So there's no real danger involved? My lips press together as I realize he really thought he might get locked in a room. No, there's no danger. Suddenly, his behavior in the elevator makes more sense. He must be claustrophobic. Let's see what their hours are. The escape room is closed, but I take a picture of the hours and the phone number so I can contact them later. It may not make it on Derek's list, but it's certainly making it on mine. The next few shops are clothing boutiques, and while they're cute, I'm not sure they would be good for the app. But the next door is a gold mine. Come on, we have to go in, I say, grabbing Derek's arm. He looks down at my hand, and I return it to my side. Okay, he doesn't like to be touched, or at least not by me. Got it. No, thank you, he says, shaking his head. This is exactly what they're looking for. How many places like this do you think exist? Not many, and for good reason. The look on his face isn't quite one of disgust, but it's close. You've left me no choice then, I say, grabbing the eight ball from my bag. Should we go inside, I ask, before flipping it over. Most likely floats into the screen. That looks like a yes. Technically, most likely is not a yes, Derek protests. It's subjective. Man, he sounds a lot like Piper sometimes. Maybe I should try to get them together. After this promotion, that is. Well, it's a lot closer than a no, so come on. Reluctantly, he follows me into the store. My eyes widen at the vast array of costumes and then at the woman wearing a cowboy hat and a fringed vest who pops up from behind the counter as we enter. Her blonde hair hangs in two braids over her shoulders. Welcome to Picture Perfect. I'm Marlene. Do you guys know what era you would like your photo to be from? I don't know if she's from the South, but her accent is pretty convincing. My mind is reeling as I scan the offerings. There was a booth like this at a fair I went to once in high school, but the options were pretty limited. Western, Victorian, caveman. But this place is like a costume cornucopia. She seems to have something from every era. I see flapper dresses and zoot suits, chaps and saloon girl outfits, poodle skirts and bell bottoms. I have no idea. I turn to Derek. What do you think? A look of pure disgust is on Derek's face. 
I'm not putting any of this on. I don't know where it's been or who's been in it. We do a thorough cleaning of every outfit after each shoot, Marlene says. And if it makes you feel better, we haven't had a customer in days. So it's almost like they're brand new. Come on, Derek. She needs the customers and our app could help her out. Be a sport. I refrain from tugging on his arm after the incident outside. But I do bat my lashes, hoping I can channel Belle and her southern charm. I will agree to anything I can put on over my current clothing. I'm not changing out of them. It's not exactly a win, but it's probably the best I'm going to get. I turn to Marlene and flash an apologetic smile. What era would work best with that restriction in mind? Marlene taps her finger against her lips as she surveys her store. Would you be opposed to a hat? Can I hold the hat? Sure, we can probably work with that. Since he doesn't want to change out of his current clothes, I would suggest either the 1920s or the Old West. His slacks would work for the 20s as long as we get the right suit coat. I sigh as I scan the options. I was hoping for something outside the normal fare. Seeing my hesitation, Marlene speaks up. We could do the more glamorous 20s look for you with the fur stole and cloche hat, rather than just the flapper dress. Okay, let's try that. I was kind of hoping for the big hoop skirt and off-the-shoulder dress like in Gone with the Wind, but a fancy flapper will have to do. Marlene leads us over to the racks that hold the 20s era outfits, and she helps pick out pieces for Derek and me. Clothing in hand, we step into the small dressing stalls to change. The dress she picked for me is nearly a perfect fit, and the stole and hat definitely add some glamour. When I step outside, I see Derek is already ready. He has a period jacket on and a hat in hand, but it's the grimace on his face that I can't get past. He looks as if I've asked him to pose for a calendar rather than a silly period picture. Try to smile for the picture, at least, I whisper, as we follow Marlene to the small studio. The studio is just a corner of the shop, but it contains the necessary lighting, a camera, the props, and a multitude of drops that Marlene fishes through before crying, Aha! Here it is! She arranges a few boxes for us to pose with and then positions us. Me sitting on a box and Derek standing with one foot on the box I'm sitting on. Hmm, it needs something. Let me see. She rummages through a prop selection and comes back with plastic champagne glasses. After handing one to each of us, she steps back and studies us again. Actually, let's have you both stand. We follow her direction and Marlene claps her hands. Yes. That looks perfect. Let's get a few like this, and then we'll change positions. Marlene snaps a few pictures, rearranges us, and snaps a few more. I'm trying to stay focused on her, but my gaze keeps slipping to Derek. He still looks uncomfortable, but the disgust is gone at least. In its place is something else, something I can't quite place. Okay, that should do it. You guys can go ahead and change back, and I'll get these loaded on the computer so you can pick one. I expect Derek to issue a sigh of relief or say something snarky, but he simply nods and walks into the stall. He's already at the counter when I step out of my stall, dress, stole, and hat in hand. Marlene points to a chair. Just set them there so I can clean them before I hang them back up. I comply and join Derek at the counter. So what challenge should they do for the app? I ask, surveying the area again. Maybe it's not a specific era, but the most realistic picture, Derek says. I turn to Marlene and briefly explain what we're doing. Do you think you'd be on board with something like that? Are you kidding? I think that would be amazing, she says. I could even offer a buy one, get one half off on the photos. 
That way, if a couple wanted two different photos or even two different eras, they could do that. I smile at Derek. This is going to be great, but I have no idea who would judge the reality of the photos. So maybe let's do a theme each month. That way, it will bring more business to Marlene if they want to participate more than one month. Ooh, I like that idea, Marlene nods, sending her braids bouncing against her shoulders. Great. Can we get a list of every era you have costumes for so we can know which ones to rotate in? Absolutely. She grabs a legal pad and begins writing information down. When she's done, she tears it out and hands it to me. Now, do you guys know which picture you'd like? I like that one, he says, pointing at the one I hate the most. Yep, still opposites. Uh, can we use that discount to get two pictures? I ask Marlene, because I really want that one. See, it's working already. She chuckles as she rings us up and hands us our separate pictures. As we exit the shop, my stomach growls and I turn to Derek. How about some lunch? He holds up his hands. I have lunch back at the office, and I think I've had enough excitement for one day. We have to include restaurants, Derek. I'll tell you what, you can pick. He folds his arms across his chest. You mean you'll let me throw an idea out and then you'll say you hate it and the eight ball gets to decide, right? I roll my eyes and laugh. No, I'll really let you decide. The eight ball will just help me order off the menu. He shakes his head, but agrees. And a few minutes later, we are sitting in a nearby cafe. Chapter 6. Derek I can't help but watch as she turns the eight ball over for each decision on the menu. Sandwich? Don't count on it. Soup? Cannot predict now. Salad? Outlook not so good. I guess you have to go hungry then, I say, shaking my head. She glares up at me. It must be you. It's never this vague when you're not around. I arch an eyebrow as I stare at her. Are you implying that my reality is messing up your nonsense? She rolls her eyes. It's not nonsense. It's fun. Haven't you ever done anything just for fun? Are you having fun? She pauses and then laughs. Not at the moment. I really want the turkey bacon croissant. Then you should order the turkey bacon croissant. She stares at me for a moment, and I think maybe rational thought has won her over when she snaps her fingers. Maybe I need to be more specific with what I ask. Should I order the turkey bacon croissant? She turns over the ball. It is decidedly so. See, I just have to remember to be specific. Or you could just make decisions for yourself, I mutter under my breath. And be a stick in the mud like you? What do you even do for fun, Derek? I work crossword puzzles, I play Scrabble, and I clean. She blinks at me. You clean? For fun? I shrug. My mother instilled the importance of cleanliness in me from a young age. It also helps with brain function, I say, referencing our earlier discussion in the elevator. Something you might see if you organized your desk space once in a while. Maybe it works better for your brain, but I thrive on organized chaos. I know where everything is at my desk. I find that hard to believe, but before I can say anything further, the waiter appears and takes our order. I can't help but notice that he smiles at Katie, and I study her to see what exactly he is seeing. Katie could be the poster child for the girl next door. Her straight brown hair falls halfway down her back, but is cut in an angle to frame her heart-shaped face. Her eyes are a light brown with speckles of gold, and she has a dusting of freckles across her cheeks. The symmetry of her face is pleasant, so I guess I can see the attraction, but I find her attractiveness overshadowed by the chaos and disorganization that runs her life. 
Is that a magic eight ball? The waiter points to the abhorrent toy she left on the table. She smiles up at him. It is. My friends got it for me recently. May I see it? He asks, holding out his hand. I'm about to remind him that his job is simply to take our order. But before I can, Katie is handing it over to him. I used to love mine. Let's see if it still works. Will I be able to get this girl's number? He turns it over and grins. You may rely on it. Hmm, I guess it still likes me. His grin grows a little larger as he hands the toy back to Katie, who now appears to be blushing. You're not really going to give him your number, are you? I hiss as Waiter Boy finally walks away. She shrugs. I think I have to. That is the way the dare works. But you don't know anything about him. He could be dangerous. He could be a serial killer. She chuckles. Working here? Doubtful. But I could use that excuse for anyone. How do I know you're not a serial killer? I'm so offended at her assertion that I respond without thinking my answer through. Not only would I be incapable of taking a human life, but do you know how messy that would be? I shudder at the mere thought of how much bleach it would take to erase bloodstains. Her shoulders began to shake, and then the laugh spills out of her lips. You're right. I guess I can be confident you're not a serial killer. When her laughter dies down, she places her elbows on the table and leans in. We should talk about the presentation. I think we open with the completed app and explain what each piece of the scavenger hunt is. I shake my head as she tries to explain her thoughts behind the presentation. No, that doesn't make any sense. We should open with the scavenger hunt goal and then show the pictures as we explain each stop. We decided to work while eating, but I rather wish we'd waited now. Arguing with her makes my stomach hurt. Why can't we show the website up front? That way they'll see all the pictures, and then we can explain why they're there. I rub a hand across my forehead. I've tried to explain why my way makes more sense about three times, but she's having none of it. Look, trust me on this. This is why Philip paired us together. He said, I'm better at organizing presentations, but you're better at talking to the clients. So when it comes time to present, I'll let you take the lead. But when it comes to organizing it, I'm in charge. She blinks at me for a moment and then tilts her head as if processing what I just said. When did Philip say that? I didn't hear him give any reasons for the pairing in the meeting. Oh, crud. I mash my lips together as I try to think up an excuse that won't hurt her feelings too much. Working with her is hard enough already, but it will be a nightmare if she hates me. Did you talk to him about me? I sigh. There is no good way out of this. Not about you specifically. I talked to him right after the meeting about working alone. I'm not good with collaboration anyway. And let's face it, you and I are complete opposites. That's when he said it. He told me I could learn a lot from you about presenting. Though true, I add the last part, hoping that will smooth down her ruffled feathers. She leans back in the booth and just stares at me for a minute, which honestly is worse than if she'd yelled. I hate uncomfortable silences, and this one is about as comfortable as getting a root canal with a jackhammer. Wow, you have some nerve. I know I may not be as structured as you, but I'm not really that hard to work with. While that is entirely debatable, I know that pointing that fact out will only make the situation worse, so I turn the blame back on me. It wouldn't have mattered how structured you were. I haven't liked working with people since high school, when I was always the one doing the work. Well, you're no longer in high school, and I'm not going to sit around and make you do all the work. If I did, we'd have the most boring presentation ever. Then, as if realizing she's gone too far, her eyes widen, 
and she throws her hand over her mouth. I'm sorry, Derek. I didn't mean that. Yeah, you did. But it's okay. I understand. My idea of fun is not always the same as other people's. I decide to offer an olive branch, even though I am a little hurt by her words. But today was enlightening, and maybe you can help me relax a little more. She smiles softly, and I hope that we are back on common, though still shaky ground. I'd like that, and maybe you can help me organize a little. I picture her desk, which is covered with piles of paper, a few picture frames, a cup containing pens, a candle, and a teapot. How she finds anything on her desk is beyond me. That might be more than even I can do, I say, and though I'm not really kidding, she chuckles and bats my arm in a teasing manner. I'm not that bad. You, on the other hand, is this a working lunch or a date? A sense of dread fills my stomach at the cocky voice that is impossible to miss. Mark and Darla are approaching our booth, and both of them grin like Cheshire cats. Of all the places to eat in this town, we had to end up at the same one? I hope it's a date. I can feel the condescension in his voice, dripping onto our table as he addresses Katie. Then he turns and fixes me with a look filled with pity. Not only might you be the only girl Derek has talked to in months, but distracting yourselves with infatuation will make it that much easier for us to win. Yeah, Darla pipes up beside him, performing her adoring flunky roll to a T. We're going to win! Mark's eyes shoot daggers at her, and he pulls her away from our table. I guess he doesn't like sharing the limelight, even with Darla. Not on your life, Katie says, loud enough for them to hear, and I can't help admiring her gumption, at least until she adds, and Derek talks to plenty of women. Her face folds as she realizes how that sounds being yelled across the cafe. Sorry, I just want to wipe that obnoxious smirk off his face more than anything. It's okay. I understand as I feel the same way. She smiles. Good. I'll organize the presentation however you think it will work best, if it means we beat him. Sounds like a plan to me. And just like that, our shaky ground has morphed into common ground. We may have differences in opinions on everything else, but beating Mark is one thing we can definitely agree on. We spend the next hour hashing out details while we eat, and then another few hours hashing out more ideas once we return to the office. By the time I head home, I'm exhausted. After the craziness of the day, the peace of my house beckons like an old friend, but when I step into the silence and close the door behind me, it is not peace that I feel. It's an odd sense that something is missing, but I have no idea what. I'm glad that my friend Tommy is coming over tonight for our weekly Scrabble tournament. It's a tradition we started in college, and I can definitely use the structured quiet time. I also feel the need to talk about Katie, which is weird because I rarely feel the need to discuss my co-workers or anything about my work. The loneliness builds as I begin preparing dinner, and I turn on some music to fill the void. I enjoy music, but I can't remember the last time I turned it on because I felt the need to. At seven sharp, the doorbell rings, and I let Tommy in. Tommy and I met in high school. He was another member of the chess club and AV team, but he was more reserved than I was. Because of that, he went into the field of computer tech, and now he codes and builds sites for some of the biggest corporations around. He also managed to find his perfect half in college. Edith is just as smart as he is, but a little more outgoing. Together, they are the perfect complement. I've never been envious of their relationship, but I find I am a little tonight. He pauses as he steps inside and looks at me, tilting his head. Are you playing music? I shrug. It was a complicated day. 
I'll tell you all about it while we eat. I can't wait. He removes his coat and hangs it on my rack. Then he brushes his hand down his checkered shirt, smoothing wrinkles before finally pulling out a chair and sitting at my table. I dish out the chicken cauliflower casserole on each of our plates before jumping into my narrative. I told you about the promotion at work, but what I found out yesterday is that my boss is insane. He decided to run it like a competition, and we got paired up with a partner. His brows lift. He knows how much I loathe working with people I don't know. In school, both of us managed to get stuck in groups where we did all the work, and the others took credit, so he understands how much I hate having to depend on someone else. How is that going? I shake my head. Today was the first day, but I don't know if I'm going to make it until we finish. Her name is Katie, and she's... something. Our day started with us getting stuck in an elevator. Tommy's brow lifts higher. You're kidding me, right? I shake my head. I wish I was. She's making decisions with a magic eight ball, and it said we had to take the elevator, but we got stuck. For how long? Tommy asks before taking a bite. For how long what? How long were we in the elevator, or how long is she making decisions with an eight ball? Tommy shrugs. Both. I don't know how long we were in the elevator. Maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Long enough for her to pull out a sketch pad and let me draw. And she's using the eight ball until Valentine's Day. But you're missing the point. We took the elevator because her toys said we had to. Then it decided we had to go to the painted plate. I stand and grab both the plate and the photo from the counter and set the plate on the table for him. He picks it up and examines it. Okay, the eight ball is a little weird, but this is cool, Derek, and probably something you would never have done on your own. He's not wrong, but that is entirely not the point. Then she made us go into a costume shop. I place the picture down with a flourish, convinced that he will see the issue now. I can't believe she got you in costume. I didn't want to, of course, but arguing with her is like scrubbing the floor with a toothbrush. Tommy rubs his chin as he studies the picture. You haven't been in a costume since high school. I didn't think you ever would again. It's not like that, I say, cutting him off. This is no time to go wandering down memory lane, especially when it's paved with sadness and loss. This was a one-time thing, and it was only because of work. Uh-huh. Well, you know, if you did, it wouldn't be a bad thing. It seemed to make you happy. No, that part of my past will remain in the past. He lets the subject die then, but it hangs in the air, a reminder of the time in my life when I had strayed from the scheduled and predictable, and disaster ensued. So, are you upset that she got you in costume or that she's making decisions with an eight ball? I throw my hands in the air. I don't know. Both. It's not rational. We went to lunch afterwards and she used the toy to order her food. Only she almost didn't get to eat because it wouldn't give her the right answers. Then she gave her number to the waiter because the ball said she should. Who does that? Tommy shrugs. I don't know. It sounds kind of fun, and people give out their phone numbers all the time. He pauses and tilts his head at me. Are you sure you're not angry that she gave her number to someone other than you? I'm glad that we've finished eating, or I might have spat my food out at him. What? That is completely ridiculous. We are like heavy metal and classical, abstract and realism, fiction and nonfiction. I could continue naming opposites, but I feel like he's getting my point. We would never work together. Methinks thou doth protest too much, he says, quoting the culturally butchered line from Hamlet. I glare at him, and he holds up his hands. Okay, you're opposites. I get it. But heavy metal and classical are both forms of music. I snort. One is definitely not music to me. Realism and abstract are both art, and fiction and nonfiction both genres of books, 
he continues, and there are people who like aspects of both. You don't have to be completely alike to work. Opposites attract, you know. Opposites, yes, but not polar opposites. We would drive each other crazy. The only thing we've found that we agree on so far is beating the other team because Mark is so smarmy. Tommy's lips lift into a mischievous grin. So there is something you agree on. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. Isn't that what that old song says? I shoot him another glare. That song was a gospel song, not a romantic ballad. But it does get me thinking. Could the spark between Katie and I turn into something more? And if it did, would the fire warm us or burn us? Somehow, I have the feeling we would both get burned. Chapter 7 Katie Today is going to be a great day. I can feel it. Yesterday, during our brainstorming, I got Derek to agree to dance lessons at On Your Toes Dance Studio, and I can barely contain my excitement as I hurry into work to meet up with him. Are you ready? I ask when I reach his desk. He frowns up at me, but I don't take offense to it. It's pretty much his normal expression after all, which is kind of sad because he might be attractive if he didn't frown so much. He definitely has the right bone structure with his chiseled features, including the cleft in his chin. Whoa, what am I doing? I am not supposed to be admiring his facial features. He sighs, pushing the traitorous thoughts from my head, thankfully. Not really, but I did agree. Yes, you did, and this will be amazing. I doubt Mark has thought of adding dancing to the list. He probably has two left feet. Actually, he's probably an amazing dancer, as Mark seems to be good at just about everything he does. But pondering his good qualities does not help me focus on squashing him at all costs. I wish there was a way to know what Mark was working on to be sure that ours was better, but regardless, I am positive our spin on it will be much better. I doubt anyone has thought of using a scavenger hunt like we have. I wouldn't put anything past Mark, he grumbles, but he grabs his coat and follows me back downstairs. I am literally bouncing as we drive to the downtown area again. I've always wanted to take dance lessons, but I never wanted to go alone, and going with my girlfriends was just odd. Are you okay? He glances at me from the corner of his eye. He still won't let me drive, but I don't mind. I don't love parking downtown anyway. Parallel parking is my nemesis. Why we can't just have normal parking lots is beyond me. I've always wanted to dance. When I was little, I wanted to be a ballerina, but my parents could never afford lessons. When I got older and could afford them myself, I didn't have anyone to go with. I didn't think you minded doing things alone, he says as he turns off the engine. Ha! Huh, what gave you that idea? I may come across as outgoing and social, but I've never enjoyed doing things alone. I much prefer having a friend along or even a group of friends. His forehead furrows in confusion. I guess I misconstrued your willingness for spontaneity as confidence. I laugh and shake my head. I like being spontaneous, and I don't even mind surprises. But I hate doing things alone. I won't eat alone. I won't go to the movies alone. And if I absolutely have to go somewhere solo... I always make sure to have a book so I don't look like I'm alone. There's a big difference between being spontaneous and whatever the word is for doing things confidently alone. I definitely don't have whatever that is. I think the word you're looking for is self-assured, he says, opening his door. But regardless, I stand corrected. Shall we go? I nod and join him on the sidewalk, taking in the building. I'm glad it's not one of those with a front wall of windows. I have no doubt we are going to be awkward for a bit.
and I don't need people walking by to stop and stare at us. The front door opens not to a studio, but to a small foyer where a lady behind the counter checks us in and points us in the direction of the correct studio. I don't know exactly what I was expecting, but it is not the larger-than-life woman in a skin-tight red dress, red lips, and poofy black hair who greets us as we enter. Welcome to On Your Toes Dance Studio. I am Pauline, and I will teach you how to... She sways her hips in an exaggerated manner. Find your rhythm. Derek turns to me, fear in his eyes. I'm quite certain this has been a mistake, and we should duck out now while we can. I elbow him and shake my head. It will be fun, and you promised to try fun, remember? He rolls his eyes and whispers, I really think we need to come to a consensual definition of this word fun. I mash my lips together and shake my head as Pauline continues. Dancing is the movement of love. It can be very sensual, but there are rules. You must keep proper form and you must feel the music. As she says this, her body moves in a way that looks more like a convulsion to me. And I hope that move won't be in her instruction today. If you have come with a partner, please stand with them now, she says. If not, I will find you a partner. This is why I never came alone, I whispered to Derek, as Pauline begins walking around the room and placing strangers together. Those poor women are getting teamed up with someone they don't even know. We barely know each other, he whispers back. Yes, but we work together. Okay, now that everyone is paired up, I will show you the proper form for our first step. She motions one of the men over and places his hand on her waist. Oblivious to the man's discomfort or the blush creeping up his face, she continues. Men, you will place your right hand on your partner's waist. Women, your hand goes on your partner's shoulder. She demonstrates this, and the poor man looks even more uncomfortable. Finally, your free hands join, but you must remember to keep the space in between you. Now, you try, and I will correct your form. She walks away from the poor guy, who scurries back to his partner. You must place your hand here, on her waist, she says to Derek when she reaches us. There is a moment of hesitation as Derek closes his eyes and takes a deep breath. I could feel offended, but I know this is hard for him. And so I wait, hoping he won't chicken out. Finally, his eyes open and he places his hand on my waist. A weird and slightly unnerving feeling courses through my body at his touch. Now you put your hand here on his shoulder. Pauline says, clearly unaware of the emotions running through me. Then you grab hands. She puts our other hands in the right position. There, now you are ready. She moves away to help another couple, and I take the opportunity to check in with Derek. You still doing okay? So far, so good, he says with a half smile. Of course, we haven't had to move yet. Okay, now we begin, Pauline says, clapping her hands. We will start with the basic box step. Men, you will step forward with your left foot. Women, you will step back with your right. Then, men will lead the next step with a step to the right, then step back with your right foot. Women, your job is to follow, so let the men lead. But men, that means you have to lead. Let's try this now. Step, step. Step. She claps her hands with each step. Derek takes the first step, but I accidentally step forward instead of backwards, and our faces collide. Ouch, I say, dropping Derek's hand to rub my nose as my eyes water. Sorry, are you okay? He asks. The concern on his face makes my heart flip in an irregular manner. I'm fine. I blink away the tears, wiping the remaining traces from my cheek, and take his hand again. 
At least, I'm fine as long as I don't count the beating of my heart, which has taken on an erratic pace. Okay, let's try again, he says. This time I step back before he steps forward, leaving a huge gap in between us. No, no, too far apart, Pauline says, appearing behind us. She pushes me closer. Now, try again. This time Derek and I both step at the same time, but not together, and he ends up stepping on my foot. Ow, I yelp as we separate again. Now the throbbing in my foot matches the throbbing on my face. Derek's face turns red as his eyes drop to the floor. Sorry, I told you I'm no good at this. Again, Pauline says, and we manage to get through a basic step with no missteps. Yes, yes, continue like this. She moves on, and Derek and I continue to practice. Slowly, we learn each other's movements, and we are able to speed up our steps. But it isn't always pretty. He steps on my foot a few more times, and I end up bumping into him more times than I can count. Every time my face gets close to his, my heart does its gymnastic routine in my chest, but I tell myself it's just because we're dancing. Dancing is romantic, that's all. It doesn't mean I'm developing feelings for the guy or anything. Before we leave, we decide taking any class will be fine for the scavenger hunt, and Pauline offers a 40% discount for anyone who mentions the app. I consider it a win. That was exhausting, Derek says as we exit the studio. Yes, it was, and now I'm starving. So how about we grab some lunch? I suppose I could eat. Shall we drive this time? I nod and follow him to the car. Are you in the mood for anything in particular? He asks as he unlocks the door. I scrunch my face and rub my chin as I slide into the passenger seat. What am I in the mood for? And more importantly, what's available around here? Ooh, how about sabatai? Warm, spicy Thai food suddenly sounds delicious. A look of alarm crosses his features. That's Thai food, correct? Yeah, hence the name. You don't like Thai food? His forehead furrows, and he shakes his head. I'm not a fan of spicy things. How could I have guessed that? Well, there is a heat scale. You could always ask for the lowest heat. I've been to some Thai restaurants where the lowest heat is still pretty spicy, but he doesn't need to know that or I'll never get him to agree. As he doesn't appear to be budging, I let out a sigh and say, Okay, where do you want to go? How about First Street Haven, he says. They have delicious sandwiches and they might even still be selling breakfast. I've heard their breakfasts are divine. Divine? I'm not sure I've ever heard a man use that word before, and especially not about food. Before I can stop it, a tiny snicker escapes my mouth, and his gaze lasers in on me. Did I say something funny? It's just divine? Most men would not use that word to describe food, or anything else. As he tenses, I realize that I've hurt his feelings, and immediately I wish I could take my words back. I was teasing, but it is clear that he did not take it that way. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. I am unlike other men in many areas. Why don't you ask your novelty toy which place we should try? It doesn't work that way. It has to be a yes or no question. Fine. He flicks his hand as if the rules of the eight ball are unimportant to him. Ask if we should eat Thai food. If it says yes, I'll agree. And if not, we dine at my suggestion. I know he's poking fun at me, but I have faith in my novelty toy. Fine. I pull it from the bag, wave my hand over it, and ask, should we have Thai food? I wait as the triangle appears in the window and then grin triumphantly at him as I hold it close for him to read. It is certain, 
Guess it's Thai food after all. I think you have it rigged, he says under his breath, but he pulls up the address on his phone and points the car in the correct direction. The restaurant looks small from the outside, with pink siding and green trim. Except for the small statues outside the front window, it doesn't even look like a Thai restaurant. But that changes as soon as we enter the establishment. A large aquarium takes up most of one wall, and traditional Thai statues greet us on the other side. Giant silver fans, like the kind you hold and fan yourself with, hang from the ceiling, and all the decorations are complemented by the dark colors running throughout. Let's make a picture with the statues as part of the hunt, I say, motioning for him to stand next to one so I can take his picture. I'm about to pose for mine when a woman with dark hair and a thick accent greets us and shows us to a table, before handing us a menu and scurrying away. Immediately, I am sucked into the menu as entree after entree jumps out at me, but I can tell that Derek is having more trouble. What do you like? I ask. Simple food, he answers. Chicken or steak and vegetables. Maybe rice or a fruit salad. I stare at him, blinking a few times as I try to process his utter lack of delicious food. What about seasoning? Flavor? He picks up his glass of water and slides a coaster underneath before answering. I use salt and pepper. That is really all that is necessary if it is cooked properly. Oh, sweet peas, how has this man existed on such bland food? Well, you are going to get much more than salt and pepper today, Derek. I suggest you try one of the curries or one of the yum dishes. He looks back down at the menu and shakes his head softly. I think I'll stick with the cucumber salad and maybe some chicken and rice on the side. I sigh and set my menu down. Derek. You have got to live a little. Try new things. I am trying new things. Cucumber salad is not something I have had before, at least not the way it appears to be made here. And with that, I know the conversation is over. Convincing him would be like trying to convince a brick wall to move, or fall, or do anything other than be a brick wall. The waitress returns and takes our orders and we stare at each other in silence until I can't stand it any longer. I pull a pin from my purse and grab a napkin. Since we've got time, let's explore other things we could do that would make a great stop on the scavenger hunt. He arches his eyebrows high on his forehead. You're going to make the list on a napkin? Why not? I don't have paper on me, do you? I honestly wouldn't put it past him to pull some out but he shakes his head. Okay, I was thinking ice skating, the sandcastle experience, and the kite festival. He shakes his head and frowns. Those are seasonal and wouldn't work year-round. I know, but they'd be great to throw in. Actually, all the festivals should be a part. They can be like bonuses in the months they occur. Festivals are fine, but we need to make sure there is enough draw year-round. I still believe we should include the Museum of Art. I cannot imagine a more boring place to visit, but I write it down. Though I don't want to believe it, I'm sure there are others like Derek out there who will find the museum divine, as he says. What else is there? Cooperville isn't huge. There's the beautiful downtown area where we are now, which features a lot of touristy shops and restaurants. There's the ocean, just a five or ten minute drive from here, and there's the more businessy district about 20 minutes away, where we work. There's the old lighthouse, he says. Perhaps they could take a picture at the top. Ooh, that's a good idea. We should also add kayaking to the list. I'm sure there's a picturesque spot they could take a picture at. We continue to offer ideas until the food arrives. My stomach growls as soon as the waitress sets my plate down in front of me. I love curry, so the duck curry was a no-brainer for me. 
Derek, on the other hand, looks a little lost as he stares down at his salad. His chicken and rice are on a separate plate. Pushing the salad to the side for a moment, he begins with the chicken and rice, and I stifle a laugh. Not feeling adventurous, huh? I'm working my way up to it. He forks a piece of chicken and examines it thoroughly before putting it in his mouth. A detective looking for clues would take less time than Derek is. If he eats every meal like this, it must take him hours to get through meals. Then again, if he makes most of his meals, he probably trusts his own cooking, boring as it is. Ignoring him for the time being, I devour my curry. It is every bit as good as I expected, the sweet and spicy flavors wrestling for control over my taste buds. It's so good, in fact, that I don't notice the coughing coming from Derek at first. And then it gets a little louder. I glance up to tell him to drink some water, and my eyes widen. His lips are not only bright red, but twice their normal size. And when he opens his mouth, I can see that his tongue is swollen too. Oh, crud. I made him try something new, and now he's having an allergic reaction. Thankfully, he doesn't appear to be going into anaphylaxis, but if his tongue gets any bigger, he might. I rummage in my bag from my wallet, throw some bills down on the table, and grab Derek's hand. He looks up at me with wide eyes. What is wrong with me? Is what I think he says, but his enunciation is garbled from his swollen tongue. You're having an allergic reaction to something you ate. Do you have an EpiPen? When he shakes his head, I pull him toward the door. Come on, we need to get you to a hospital. Give me your keys. Nuh-uh, he says, shaking his head. I can drive. Or at least I'm pretty sure that's what he says. No, you can't. It's not safe. If you go into anaphylaxis behind the wheel, that would be dangerous. So give me the keys. I hold my hand out and wait for him to fork them over. He looks like he wants to argue, but in the end, his analytical mind wins, and he drops them in my hand. I drag him out of the restaurant, hollering to the waitress as we pass. Sorry, we have to go. Money is on the table. Food was great. Then we're outside and racing to the car. The redness has now spread from Derek's lips to the rest of his face, reminding me of the cover for an old French film, The Red Balloon. I just hope he doesn't look in the mirror before we get him some treatment. He might kill me if he does. Thankfully, or not so thankfully, I'm really not sure at the moment. He seems more focused on giving me warnings about his car than about his face. Not so fast, he says, putting his hand on the dashboard, as if he thinks he can physically slow the car down that way. Okay, yes. I am speeding a little bit, but if he saw himself right now, I doubt he would be asking me to slow down. More than likely, all his little rules would go flying out the window. But I slow down a little, mainly because I don't need him having a heart attack on top of an allergic reaction. When we reach the ER, I scramble out quickly and practically drag him into the hospital. I have no idea how bad his reaction will be, and there's no way he's tanking on my watch. Hey, guy with an allergic reaction here, I call out as we enter. Derek shakes his head at me, and if his face didn't already resemble a tomato, I have a feeling it would have at my outburst, but I am not deterred. A nurse with a fierce expression hurries over, probably to tell me to quiet down and wait my turn, as there are quite a few people in the ER already but she takes one look at Derek and her posture changes. Her hand flies to her chest. Oh my, do you know what you're allergic to? Derek shakes his head. I didn't know I had allergies. She turns her attention to me. Do you know what he's allergic to? Me? The question emerges like a squeak, and I shake my head. We're not together. We just work together. We had Thai food, that's all I can tell you. 
Derek rolls his eyes at me, but the nurse just nods and leads him back to an exam room. There is no way I'm following them in there, so I grab a seat and pull out my phone. You'll never believe where I am. I tap into the group chat I share with my friends. Charlie. Where? She's probably between clients, so I'm not surprised she is the first person to respond. Me. At the ER with Derek? Belle. Did you break him? Me. No, I'm not Charlie. I'm not exactly out of shape. Curvy is definitely a shape, though I'll admit my cardio could use some work. I despise running, and I'm fairly certain I'd be the one first eaten in a zombie apocalypse. But I consider that my contribution to humanity. I'll go first so someone who likes to run can live a little longer. Charlie, however, is like the Jillian Michaels at her gym. Not only does she run like 50 miles a month, but she works out with huge guys and tiny girls alike and leaves them all in a puddle of sweat at the end of an hour. Plus, I'm pretty sure she knows at least two ways to kill someone with her bare hands, even though I can't prove it. I asked her once, but in true Charlie fashion, she said, I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. So she's got me on that one, at least for now. Charlie, I've never broken anyone, yet. Then she adds emojis of muscles, a smile, and the devil. Me, yet being the operative word. Anyway, Derek and I were having lunch, and then all of a sudden his lips and tongue were swollen and he broke out in a rash. Hannah, wait, you were having lunch with him? I thought this was a business partnership. When did lunches become a part of it? Of course, she pops in when I mention lunch. She'll probably decide we're dating now since we've eaten a meal together. Or actually two now. Me. When we had to eat. I told you guys we decided on a scavenger type app. People will visit these places and take pictures of random criteria we give them. Then they can post them to be entered into a monthly drawing. Belle. That's such a great idea. I wish I could do something like that for my business. I picture her sighing and flipping her blonde hair as she says this. Piper, you don't have a business. You have a social media presence, which is not the same thing. Belle, it's as much work as a business, I think. Now I'm picturing her pouting. I definitely know these women too well. I shake my head, wishing we were having this conversation in person so I could make them focus. Me. Yesterday, we did the painted plate and the studio place. Today, we went dancing, which was interesting to say the least. Belle. You danced with him? Even though it's over text, I can almost see Belle's eyes light up. That's so romantic. I should see if Jackson will go dancing with me. I roll my eyes. Me. It was definitely not romantic. I'm pretty sure I'm going to have a gnarly bruise on my foot. Anyway, we figured restaurants should be included since people have to eat. He wanted boring food and I wanted Thai food. And the eight ball said Thai, but now I feel kind of bad. And I do. I mean, my food was delicious, but I didn't want him to have to go to the hospital. Belle. I'm sure it's not as bad as you think. At least this way, he'll know what he's allergic to. Hannah, leave it to you to find the ray of sunshine in an allergic reaction. I just want to know if any other sparks were flying. You know, he could be your stability and you could push him to new experiences. Oh, I definitely did that. Pushed him to the new experience of a swollen tongue and a trip to the hospital. I'm sure he's planning our wedding already. Me. No, there's nothing like that. We are co-workers. That is all. But even as I type it, I think back to watching him paint. He was so different when he was focused on something. An almost boyish charm stole across his face and made him appear much more relaxed and not so stiff. He could be cute if he could be like that more often. And then there was that moment when he touched my chin. 
I wouldn't necessarily call them sparks, but something coursed through my body. Hannah, a co-worker who took him to the hospital. She adds the winky face emoji and then kissy lips. Me, I couldn't very well let him die in the restaurant, and I had no idea how bad it might get. Speaking of which, I should probably check on him. Hannah, we want details later. The other girls chime in with their agreement. I send a thumbs up emoji because sending words might start another conversation, and I don't want that. Tucking my phone in my pocket, I make my way to the nurse's desk. Hey, is there any update on Derek Davis? I ask. Without glancing up at me, she taps a few keys on her computer. Are you family? Uh, no. I'm his co-worker, but I'm the one who brought him in. Then I'm sorry, but you'll just have to wait. I can't discuss his medical condition with anyone but family. Medical condition? Is it worse than I thought? I thank the woman and head back to my chair, shooting off an email to Philip to let him know we probably won't make it back to the office today. Thankfully, we have a little leeway for the next few weeks while we work on this promotion, but it's never a good idea to just ghost your employer. With that taken care of, I curl into the chair and open my e-reader app. Since I seem to have time, I might as well read one of the books that has been filling my TBR list. Chapter 8. Derek. Humiliation is a word I'm intimately acquainted with, but one that hasn't defined me for several years. Not since high school. But it is the perfect word for how I'm feeling right now. Not only do I sound like an idiot trying to answer the nurse's questions with my swollen tongue, but she's asked me to remove my shirt for the examination and a possible allergy test. I can't remember the last time I removed my shirt around another person. I don't even get in a pool without a t-shirt on. Although, actually, I don't get in a pool, period. Too many people crowding the area and spewing their germs— Plus, there's a reason that sign, welcome to our ool, notice there's no P in it, let's keep it that way, exists. Too many people getting too comfortable in the water. Or lazy. It's probably more out of laziness. Reluctantly, I remove the shirt and allow her to examine me. When she finishes, she sits on the stool and stares up at me. So, can you tell me where you ate lunch? Perhaps I can pull up their menu and we can narrow down the culprits. The nurse smiles at me, but I can tell she is frustrated. I'm not the best patient, but then I didn't ask to be a patient at all. Tabatai, I say, struggling to speak around my swollen tongue. Thankfully, she appears to understand me and taps quickly on the computer. And what did you eat? Cucumber thalith. Cucumber salad. Well, that has few ingredients, so that should help. Have you had cucumber before? I nod. It's a staple in my diet, but that's more than I want to try to say right now. Okay, how about carrots? I nod again. Peanuts? Another nod. Lime? I start to nod and then pause. Have I had lime? I can't remember ever buying it. I don't like oranges, and I've never tried grapefruits or lemons. Are there other citrus fruits? I'm not there. The nurse smiles. Well, I'm going to guess you have a citrus allergy. It's pretty rare, but manageable. I'll inform the doctor and we'll get you started on treatment. He'll probably want to do some blood work as well. As she leaves, I lie back on the bed and wonder what Katie is doing. Did she leave me? Surely not. She may lack order and structure, but she doesn't seem mean. Plus, she has my car, so she has to know I'd have no way to get home. But then I remember the eight ball and sit up so fast my head spins. That eight ball doesn't seem to like me, and if she asks it, no, she wouldn't. 
I'm about to head out to check for myself when the door opens and the doctor enters. I see you're having a bit of an allergic reaction, he says, scanning his tablet and then glancing up at me. His eyes widen slightly as he takes in my puffy face and swollen lips. I haven't looked at my face yet, but it feels a lot like it did when Bryce beat me up in middle school, so I imagine it looks similar. Of course, my lips weren't burning then, nor was my tongue swollen. The nurse thinks it's a citrus allergy. Let's get you some epinephrine to bring down the swelling, and then we'll do some blood work. I think we can skip the allergy test since you'd eaten all the other ingredients. You can go ahead and put your shirt back on. Relieved, I pull it back on. But before I can relax, the doctor has stabbed my thigh with something. I jump, but before I can react, my heart begins beating faster. However, shortly after that, the heat cools on my face and I swear I can feel my tongue shrinking. How are you feeling? The doctor asks. Better. Thank goodness my voice sounds normal again. Good. We'll get you on some medication to bring down the rest of the swelling. I'll have the nurse come back in to draw blood, and we're going to get you a prescription for one of these. He waves the EpiPen. An allergy to citrus fruits is pretty rare. You really had no idea? I shake my head. I remember trying oranges when I was little and being dissuaded by their acidity, though I do not remember reacting like this. I don't believe I've tried any other citrus fruits. Well, it is possible to just have an allergy to limes, but my recommendation would be to avoid all citrus fruits just in case. I wholeheartedly concur, and since I don't really like them anyway, it should be an attainable goal. I'll just have to read ingredients more carefully when I go out, which isn't often. Or it wasn't until Katie was thrust into my life. Twenty minutes later, I'm heading back to the waiting room with a Band-Aid on my arm, a prescription in my hand, and more knowledge about allergies than when I entered. I settle the account and then turn to scan for Katie. But she is not in any of the chairs. There's an old guy who's mostly asleep until his own snores wake him up, a young boy who keeps trying to get closer to the old man, and a frazzled woman, probably the boy's mother, who keeps hissing, Johnny, come back here. But there is no Katie. Seriously? The woman poisons me, then dumps me at a hospital and steals my car? Does she not remember that I know where she works? Then she enters from a hallway that I assume leads to bathrooms and the elevator. Oh, are you done? You look better. How are you feeling? There is real concern on her face, and I feel a little bad that I assumed she stole my car. That's just going to remain my little secret. I am finished for now, though they did some blood work I will have to follow up with. It appears I am allergic to limes so I must avoid citrus fruits in the future. And here I was going to treat you to a pineapple lemonade, she says with a smile. For a moment, I stare at her, wondering if I should rethink my guilt. Does she plan to eliminate me in more ways than just the competition? Then she smacks my arm and says, I'm kidding, Derek, that was a joke. She pauses as if waiting for me to laugh. But as I don't find it funny, I simply stare at her. Finally, she sighs. Come on, it's been a long day, and I don't know about you, but I'm tired. Agreed. I can certainly use a respite before tomorrow, but I do believe it's only fair that you let me choose the venues for our next excursion. She opens her mouth as if to argue, but when I lift an eyebrow at her and point to my band-aid, she sighs instead. I suppose you've earned that. The museum, then? And then the lighthouse, if it's not raining. Both of these activities seem peaceful and unlikely to threaten my existence, unlike today. I hold out my hand for the car keys, but Katie does not seem to understand my request. The keys, please. Oh, right. She reaches into her pocket and pulls out the keys, but before she hands them over, she asks, are you sure you're okay to drive? 
I am completely fine. Plus, I never let people drive Leia. You were only afforded the opportunity because I was ill. Her eyebrow arches on her forehead. Did you just call your car Leia? I did. A heat of embarrassment slowly spreads up my neck. That is not a detail I normally let slip. Now let's go. I reach for the keys, but she pulls her hand back, just out of my reach. As in Princess Leia? It might be an homage to one of my favorite movies, yes. Everyone is allowed at least one guilty pleasure. Oh, I agree. I just didn't picture you for an adventure movie type of guy, she says, finally relinquishing the keys. Yes, well, I'm unsure what else to say, although I'm tempted to ask her what type of movie she thinks I watch. She'd probably say documentaries or the History Channel, which I do watch. I realize my liking Star Wars might be a bit of an anomaly, but perhaps that's why I like it. Skywalker and Solo are so different from me. They are brave and charming and able to do anything, while I feel much more like C-3PO, awkward and misunderstood. I remember the first time I watched the movie, I was so enamored with Luke Skywalker that I found a stick in my yard and pretended it was a lightsaber. For hours on end, I had imaginary sword fights and slashed at bushes. But when I accidentally smacked my father in my exuberance, he broke my stick and sent me to my room to study. My mother reacted similarly when I used her dining room chairs to pretend I was flying the Millennium Falcon, but ended up pulling her tablecloth off the table along with the dishes on top. Only half of them broke, but it had been another lecture, another trip to my room, and after that, the Star Wars movie had disappeared. However, it lived on in my head, and later, when I was old enough, in the books that I read. Shall we? I say, returning to the present. Of course. The drive back to the office is quiet, but unlike this morning, the silence doesn't feel strained. I wouldn't go so far as to say we're friends, but I suppose it's hard to not get a little closer to someone after an experience like ours. When we pull into the parking lot, I want to say something, but I'm not sure what. Thank you? It doesn't quite seem right, considering she is the reason I had to go to the ER at all. It was fun? Not really. Looking forward to tomorrow? Am I? Have a good night, is what comes out of my mouth, and Katie chuckles softly. You too, she says, and then she is gone. I watch until she gets in her car and drives away, because it's the gentlemanly thing to do. And then I head home but on my way, I dial Tommy. I almost died today, I say when he answers. Doing what? Working with Katie. It started off in a dance studio of all places, but then I ended up in the emergency room. I pull into my driveway, but make no motion to get out of the car. From dancing? No, from limes. Evidently, I'm allergic. They served limes at a dance studio? What kind of studio was this? No, not at the studio. We went to lunch afterwards. Her eight ball said we had to have Thai food. He chuckles on the other end. Chuckles. Wow, you really might not make it to the end of this challenge. This is not funny, I say. I could have died. His voice sobers. You're right. Are you okay? Thankfully, Katie drove me to the emergency room. Wait. You let Katie drive Leia? I didn't really have a choice considering my face was swollen, but I'm not sure I should continue to work with her. Why? Because of this? It sounds like an accident. No, because... I stop, unable to finish my sentence. Because you're having fun with her? Because she's not structured? Tommy sighs. Derek, you can't let that accident rule your whole life. I know, but I don't want to talk about it any further. It's not a path I want to go down yet. Listen, I'm home and feeling the need for rest. Thanks for listening.
Any time, my friend. I'm always here for you. But I can hear in his voice that he wishes I could get past this. I do too. I'm just not sure how. Chapter 9. Katie. As expected, I am peppered with questions the moment I walk in the door. How is he? Did any sparks fly? Will he recover? He's fine. They gave him an EpiPen and he has to avoid citrus fruits, but he'll be fine. No, there were no sparks, unless you count the ones coming from his eyes when he looked at me. Pretty sure they were angry sparks, or at least annoyed ones. A reaction like his is relatively rare. 39% of people who have pollen allergies have an OAS to food, but their reaction is generally mild. Piper looks up from her phone. I've been researching. Of course she has. Well, regardless of how rare it is, he had a reaction, and I feel terrible. I know I'm supposed to let the eight ball make all the decisions, but I told him he could pick the next place we go to. I hope you guys understand. I think an exception can be made in this case. Charlie glances around, gathering nods from the other girls. Thank you, I sigh, as I sink into one of the kitchen table chairs. It's been a long day. There's a moment of quiet, and then an exchange of conspicuous glances between my friends. Clearly, something else is on their minds, but I'm sure it's nothing good. Has Waiter Boy called? Hannah asks, switching the subject and referencing the waiter who asked for my number yesterday. I probably shouldn't have shared that piece of information with them, as it will no doubt be a daily question now. But, oh well. Nope, sorry. If you guys hoped this eight ball was going to have me dating more, I'm afraid it's backfiring. Then I think it's time we go out and see if we can help it along. Hannah wiggles her eyebrows suggestively. Why do people do that? Do they think it's likely to be more convincing? Because it's not working. Ugh, not tonight. It's been a long day. I don't normally mind going out with my friends, but after today, I just want to chill out with a movie or a really good book and relax. I'm afraid you don't get to decide. Her eyes slide to my bag where she knows the eight ball resides. She's right, Charlie says. We've already given you a pass on tomorrow, so you do have to consult it. Fine. I grumble as I pull it out of my bag. Should we go out tonight? I turn the ball over and smile slightly when my reply is no floats to the top. Ha, huh, guess it's a relaxing night in after all. Hannah pouts and crosses her arms over her chest. I thought the ball was supposed to be on our side. It's on no one's side, Piper says. It is a random probability of answers. It is just as likely to give a yes answer as a no or a maybe one. Hannah shoots her a glare. Well, I feel like going out anyway. Who's with me? Belle and Charlie voice their agreement, but Piper declines, stating she has a ton of work to do for her company. She's the one who really should be going out. In fact, I haven't heard her talk about Ian for a while. I wonder briefly if something happened between them, but that is not my problem for tonight. A feeling of relief floods through me as the other girls get ready. Once they leave, perhaps I'll get that quiet night after all. The next morning, I stop at a coffee shop on the way to work. I have no idea what kind of coffee Derek drinks, so I take my chances with a straight black coffee. Will there be anything else? The woman behind the counter, a perky blonde with her hair pulled back in a ponytail, asks as she hands me the cup. The name on her little white tag is Pepper, and I can't help but smile a little as I wonder if she gets called Peppy Pepper. I bite the inside of my lip to keep from giggling. I don't want her to think I'm laughing at her. Then I shift my eyes to the baked goods. Yes, what is the safest muffin you have? 
Her smile slips as confusion etches lines on her perfectly heart-shaped face. Safest? Yeah, like the least likely to send someone into allergic shock. I don't think any of our muffins do that, she says with a slow shake of her head. I am clearly not getting my point across very well. Look, it's a muffin for a very structured guy who just found out he has a citrus allergy. It's an apology for sending him to the ER yesterday. She looks at me as if I've grown a third eye, but I can't blame her. I'm not articulating as well as I would like. I guess our brand muffin would be the best bet. I don't think it has anything other than gluten in it that someone could be allergic to. Is he allergic to gluten? I honestly have no idea, but I'll try the bran muffin. With a look of relief, she puts it in a bag and takes my money. I grab a few packs of sugar in case Derek likes them in his coffee and continue on to work. Good morning, I say as I approach his desk. I come bearing gifts, a peace offering if you will. He glances up at me, and his lips lift the tiniest fraction. It's nothing citrus, is it? Ha ha, you're funny. I pull a chair over to sit on the opposite side of his desk. No, it is coffee. Black for you, and white chocolate mocha for me. I did grab you some sugars in case you use them. I don't. He grabs the coffee. I do add milk on occasion, but only when I can control the amount figures. And a bran muffin, the plainest one I could find. I pull it out and hand it to him. Thank you. He takes it, but doesn't open it. Instead, he pulls open a drawer and drops it inside. I've already had breakfast, but I'll save it for later. Are you ready for today? The Adventure of the Museum of Art? Yeah, I'm psyched. I can't keep the sarcasm from my voice because I honestly can't think of anything more boring. But after yesterday, I'll put on my excited face for Derek and pretend. Have you thought of something they can do for the scavenger hunt while there? I hope he has because I certainly have no idea. I have. There are many wonderful exhibits that we could spotlight and encourage them to take a picture with. We could leave a clue each month, like information about the artist of that month, or an exhibit. That way, patrons absorb magnificent art as well as interact with the app. Plus, I'm hopeful the museum will offer a discount like Pauline did. Well, okay then, let's go. He makes it sound a tiny bit more interesting, but I still have the feeling this is going to be a boring day for me. I don't even ask to drive. It is clear that not only does he have control issues, but for whatever reason, he doesn't trust me behind the wheel. I don't mind, though. The Museum of Art is a large building near the waterfront. While I will admit it has some cool glass sculptures outside, I've never been inside. Walking around and looking at paintings sounds about as fun as watching paint dry to me. But this is a partnership, and I will go along at least until the next activity, and then I'm asking the eight ball about the escape room. As we step inside the museum, it feels like the noise has been sucked out like a vacuum. It's not silent, but there is a definite change from the noise outside to the hushed stillness inside. Even footsteps on the marble floor seem quieter here. Where would you like to start? Derek asks and this time the smile on his face is noticeable, as is the light in his eyes. It's almost worth being here just to see the change on his face. He looks like a kid in a candy store, while I probably look like a kid who wishes they were in a candy store, but their mother has told them for the hundredth time how much candy will rot their teeth. So I defer to him once again. I have no idea where we should start, so I'll leave that up to you. Hmm, this way then. I am relieved that he appears to be heading toward the more traditional art and away from the abstract art. With landscapes and people, I can at least appreciate the talent. But with abstract, I feel like it's something I could have done as a child or something I could do now with my eyes closed. 
This artist is one of my favorites. He stops in front of one of the most gorgeous paintings I've ever seen. He's no Monet or Picasso, but there's something about his paintings that I like. I step closer to take the whole painting in. It's of a couple walking along a street that appears to be in Europe or Italy, somewhere with older architecture. There's no evidence of rain falling, but the street is painted so that it resembles a reflective sheen from the lights, and it is vibrant. Every color is bright, and while some blend into the color next to them, others stand apart. Some brushstrokes like the sky are clearly seen, while the rest of the painting looks more like a photograph. This is beautiful. A part of me wants to reach out and touch the picture to see if I could be transported there. It is. Sadly, the artist, Leonid Afremov, passed away in 2019. The world lost an amazing talent that day. Absolutely. And I think he should be our first scavenger hunt clue. If his paintings can make me want to come here, then I think they could for others, too. Derek smiles at me and nods. Okay, shall I take a picture of you in front of this one? Let's take one together. The words pop out before I can stop them, and my breath catches when I realize what I've just said. Maybe it's this place, or the way this painting makes me feel, but I don't find Derek quite as stiff and annoying as I did at first. My eyes are locked on his, waiting for any sign of how he feels. One step forward or two steps back. Finally, he nods and pulls out his phone. Okay, let's do it. He's not exactly smiling, but he's not frowning either. I'll take it as a win. He takes a step closer to me and holds the phone out so we can both be in the picture with the beautiful painting visible behind our heads. As I stare at the two of us on the phone screen, something inside me moves. It's not a tingle or a shudder, it's just a, a movement. A feeling that something has shifted between us, though I don't know what and couldn't name it if I had to. I wonder if he's feeling it too. But that thought is interrupted by a voice I never thought I would hear again. Katie, is that you? Even though I want to pretend I haven't heard her, if I ignore her, she'll go away, right? My head swivels toward the grating sound of her voice. And there she is, smiling at me with her sugary fake smile. Her perfect blonde hair hangs in perfect waves to her shoulders. Her satiny shirt and skirt hug her perfect petite frame, and her perfect red lips display her blazingly white teeth. Perfectly. If the word had a picture next to it in the dictionary, Amy would be it. She is perfect in every single way except one. She is a terrible friend. A terrible friend who stole my fiancé. Amy, so nice to see you. I lie, as I frantically try to think of a way to explain Derek. She knows me well enough to know he's not a relative, and calling him my co-worker, while true, leaves me with no ammunition. And I need some ammunition. So I say the one thing I never thought I'd say in a million years. This is my boyfriend, Derek. I'm not sure who is more surprised by this statement, but thankfully, Derek's surprise leaves him speechless and unable to deny it. Boyfriend, huh? Amy's eyes roam over Derek like he's an item at an auction, and I wait for her to make a move on him. She stole my boyfriend once, so what's to stop her again? I didn't know you were seeing someone. Finished with her appraisal, she turns her gaze back to me and smiles. Smiles as if we're still friends or something. How long have you been dating? Derek is still speechless, so I take his arm and stare up at him with what I hope is a look of adoration. Please don't ruin this, is the message I mentally send to him as I say, oh, for about four months, right, honey? 
His eyes are wide as he looks down at me, and I send another mental plea. I've picked up on the fact that he doesn't always catch social signals, but I'm sure hoping he catches this one. For another second, he just blinks at me, and then I swear I see this change come over him. He pulls back his shoulders, pulls me to his side, and flashes the most charming smile I've ever seen on his face at Amy. Actually, darling, I think it's closer to five, but it's so hard to be sure since time stands still when I'm with you. Now it's my turn to stare, and I know my mouth is hanging open. What the heck just happened? He's like another person entirely. Well, isn't that nice, Amy says, though the tone of her voice implies it is anything but. Are you still at the same address? Uh, yeah, I answer, confused as to why she would even want to know. Perfect. It was so nice to meet you, Derek, and to see you again, Katie. Maybe we'll meet again soon. Her smile is more predatory than genuine, and it is punctuated by the swinging of her hips as she walks away. When she is out of sight, Derek's arm falls from my shoulder and the stiffness returns. I suppose you won't mind telling me who that was and what just happened? My shoulders fall as the memories of the past return with full force. How about over some ice cream? I'm honestly not sure I could tell him here. I need to get out of this place and away from Amy, from the past, before I can spill that secret. He nods and leads the way to the car. Part of me feels badly that he didn't get to see as much of the museum as he wanted, but the rest of me is filled with relief. Fifteen minutes later, we pull into the small ice cream shop. After scanning the flavors, I decide today is definitely a double brownie chocolate chunk kind of day. But I'm surprised when Derek orders the same thing. You did not strike me as an uber chocoholic like myself, I say, as we grab a small table by the window. I do not indulge in ice cream or chocolate very often, but it is another guilty pleasure he says, before spooning a large bite into his mouth. You seem to have a lot of those hidden guilty pleasures. He is definitely surprising me, and I'm starting to wonder if there are two sides to Derek, the professional business side he shows everyone, and the more free, fun-loving side that rarely gets let out. A tinge of pink colors his cheeks, and he drops his eyes to his ice cream, but it's enough of a reaction to tell me I might be right. I wonder what it would take to get the other side to come out more often. So you told me you would enlighten me as to who your friend was and why you pretended we were together. Though I knew it would be a long shot, I had been hoping he would forget. But I should have known better. Derek is like an elephant that way, remembering everything. That was Amy. She was one of my best friends in college. His brow lifts slightly. I'm assuming something happened to destroy the friendship? A mirthless laugh spills from my lips. You could say that. My senior year, the guy I had been seeing, Adam, asked me to marry him. And of course, I said yes. He took forever to set a date, and somewhere along the way, he decided that he had more in common with Amy then with me, and he called off the engagement. I lost both my friend and my fiancé that day. Derek sets his spoon down in his bowl, and his eyes lock on mine. I've never really noticed them before, but now that I feel like they're holding me in a tractor beam, I have no choice but to peruse them. They are a deep brown, like a velvety chocolate, but there's tiny flecks of gold that appear to sparkle when the light hits them just right. They are... mesmerizing. I'm sorry that happened to you. That must have shaken your trust in people. People, relationships, friendships, the world, really. Though there had been other instances growing up, that was definitely the defining moment that made me lose faith in my ability to make good decisions. 
I shake my head. I guess you could say that, but I'm doing okay now. Are you? Is that why you told her we were together? He takes another bite, and I find myself watching his lips. Why am I doing that? I don't like him. Not like that, anyway. But at the museum? Okay, maybe I'm not totally better, but I'm working on it. We should talk about you, though. What was with that persona that came over you? You were like a different person back there. His eyes drop from mine. Ah, uh, yes, that. Yes, that? That's all he's going to say about it? I don't think so, buddy. Let me guess, another guilty pleasure? Something like that. He mumbles into his ice cream, and I am even more intrigued. We should probably get another stop in today. Do you feel up to the lighthouse? Actually, I really want to go kayaking. It is clear he is not going to divulge any more about this other persona right now. But that's okay, because I can wait. I'll just keep chipping away the layers until he cracks and reveals all. That is one of my strengths, or maybe annoyances, depending on who you ask. Derek shakes his head. I don't think I'm up for kayaking. Well, then I guess it's time for a third opinion. He groans as I pull the eight ball from my bag, but I just smile at him. Should we go to the lighthouse? I flip the ball over and cannot predict now floats to the top. Guess that's a no. Should we go kayaking instead? This time, without a doubt, pops to the top, and I grin as I hold the ball so Derek can see it. I'm seriously considering getting you a new one, he says, shaking his head in disbelief. That one is definitely rigged. Rigged or not, I win. He sighs, but I see a hint of a smile on his face, and I wonder if we both aren't winning in some small way. Chapter 10. Derek. She's looking at me differently. I can feel it, but I'm not sure what to do about it. I don't know what came over me at the museum. Well, I do, but I thought that part of me was gone forever. I shoved it down and piled so much order and routine on top of it that I didn't think it would ever surface again. But then she looked at me, and I could tell she needed me, and bam, he popped out like he'd never been gone. The other, Derek. Daring Derek, as I like to call him. I'm fairly certain Daring Derek has always been a part of me. He was the one who pretended to be Solo or Skywalker when I was young, until he was suppressed and forced to retreat at my parents' insistence. Unfortunately, he made a comeback in high school when the theater teacher asked me to help run the lights for the school play. At first, running the lights was fulfilling enough, but then I wanted to be on the stage. I wanted to pretend to be someone else, someone whose parents paid attention to them, someone who wasn't picked on for his clothing choices, someone who people saw. I never thought letting him out would have such devastating consequences. And so he got shut back inside. I padlocked the door and refused to think about him again. Until now. I want to tell her about that guy, which is weird, because I've never wanted to tell anyone about that guy. But she's different. There's something about her that makes me want to open up to her, and then the fear takes over. I'm afraid she'll stop looking at me like she has been since the museum. Something changed there, and I don't want to break it. It feels like a tenuous thread between us, but one that could grow stronger if nurtured. Or snap like a twig if pulled. Here we are, I say, as if she can't see that from the boat launch in front of us. Are you sure you want to do this? Though she makes me feel a little more adventurous, this is water, and I'm not good with water. The sun is shining and it's warm outside, which is nearly unheard of in February. Yes, I'm sure I want to go kayaking. Now, come on. It may be warm outside, 
but there's no way the water will be warm, and I have no desire to end up a frigid popsicle today. But before I can say any of that, she opens the car door and begins walking toward the rental shop. With a sigh, I jog to catch up and arrive just in time to hear the guy behind the counter tell her he's out of kayaks. You're a rental shop. How can you be out of kayaks? He shrugs. Look around, lady. It's nice outside, so a ton of people had the same idea you did. Look, a few should be coming in within half an hour if you want to wait. She turns to me, her lips twisted into a comical pout. What do you think? Do you want to wait? I check my watch. It is still early afternoon, which means we have plenty of time to wait. And there's nothing else pressing on the schedule. I don't mind. Maybe we can scout out a good place to take a picture until then. Katie's eyes light up. Ooh, that gives me a great idea. Can we borrow an oar? Confusion covers the counter guy's face but then he shrugs and hands one over. Make sure it comes back. Of course it will come back. What could I possibly do with one oar? She rolls her eyes at the guy, but that is the question on my mind as well. What is she going to do with one oar? Come on, she says to me, and hurries toward the shoreline. When we reach the edge, she takes off her socks and shoes and begins rolling up her pant legs. What are you doing? I don't believe they allow waiting around here. Don't worry, it will only be for a minute, just long enough to get a picture. With her task done, she grabs the oar and steps into the water. Her eyes widen as an enormous shiver runs down her body. Okay, this is colder than I thought. Hurry and take the picture. I grab my phone and survey the area to determine the best angle. When I see the lighthouse in the distance off to the right, I urge her to move that way so I can get it in the shot. Perfect. Right there. She stops and triumphantly holds up the oar. I manage to snap the picture, but before I can even lower the camera, I see the wake from a large boat rise up behind her. It knocks her forward, And for a second, I think she'll be okay. But then her eyes widen and she's gone from the screen of the camera. There's a splash and then a yelp. And before I know what I'm doing, I've stripped off my shoes, tossed the phone to the ground and emptied my pockets to go in after her. I'm in the water to my ankles when she stands up, a wet, soggy mess. Are you okay? My teeth are already chattering as the cold is registering in my feet. I can only imagine how much colder she must be. Um, I think so. She is visibly shivering, but seems fine otherwise until she takes a step and winces. Oh, maybe not. I step closer to her, ignoring the biting cold racing up my legs. But my foot slips on a rock, my arms pinwheel, and I fall face first into the cold water. Shock floods my body as the cold envelops me and pulls on me like it has talons. Cold, so cold, I say, as I push myself back to my feet. Are you okay? Katie asks. She's still standing in the same spot, shivering, but now concern is etched on her face as well. Yeah, you? I think I twisted my ankle, but otherwise, yes. I reach her side, and without thinking, wrap an arm about her waist. She throws her arm over my shoulder, and together we carefully make our way back to shore. I help her sit down before grabbing the oar and taking it back to the guy behind the counter, who looks at me with wide eyes, shakes his head, and then hands me a few towels in exchange. When I reach Katie again, she is staring down at her ankles, comparing them. I've had no medical training, but I examine them as well to see if anything jumps out at me. One does look a little larger than the other. She manages to get the sock and shoe on the uninjured ankle, but as she tries on the injured one, she gasps in pain, then looks up at me with panic in her eyes. What if it's broken? It can't be broken. 
Let's not get ahead of ourselves. I wrap one towel around her and use the other to dry myself off as much as I can. You probably wouldn't have been able to walk on it if it was broken. I don't actually know that. Anatomy was not my favorite subject in school, but it sounds correct. Right, you're right. Did we at least get the photo? Yeah, I think so. I glance around for my phone, glad that I tossed it on the ground before I went in the water. That would have been an expensive disaster. Finding it a few feet away, I grab it and swipe the screen, laughing as the image loads. Well, I can't say it's the best picture, but it's something. I hold it out for her to see. I'd say we need to redo it, but that's not happening, she says with a chuckle. I shove the phone in my pocket and pull on my socks and shoes before helping her to her feet. It's a slow return to the car as she's hopping more than walking, but we finally make it, and after helping her into the passenger seat, I point the car toward the ER once more. You know, they're going to wonder about us coming in two days in a row. She laughs. Well, at least it's me this time and not you, but yeah, I'll be surprised if we don't get some kind of reaction. Who knew marketing was so dangerous? Definitely not me. I am not enticed by danger. Not even a little, she asks. I shake my head. I prefer the safety and security of routine. At least I had. After spending a few days with Katie, and especially after the escape of Daring Derek at the museum, I wonder if that's still true. And I think that we are troubled together. Well, then I guess it's a good thing we only have another week or so. Yeah, I guess. I should be happy about that, but for some reason, it makes me sad. After parking, I help Katie out of the car. Then, before I can think about it, I slide my arm around her waist, and her arm snakes around my shoulder. Sensations I am not used to course through my body and my heart beats like I've just run five miles on a treadmill. Relief and disappointment fill me as she checks in at the nurse's station and is whisked back to a treatment room. As I sit down to wait for her, I try to sort through the emotions running through my head. A week ago, I thought Katie Malone was the craziest person I knew. Now, I'm beginning to wonder if I am. Chapter 11. I don't know if the doctor I see is the same one Derek saw, but he shakes his head when I tell him how I ended up hurting myself. Well, the good news is that it's not broken. It is, however, a pretty good sprain. You'll need to ice it and elevate it for the next two days and stay off it as much as possible. Thankfully, it's Friday, so I'll have the weekend to rest up. Unfortunately, he hands me a pair of crutches and insists I use them until the swelling goes down and the pain disappears. Not only am I not good with crutches, but they are definitely not sexy. Not that I'm thinking about being sexy. I mean, who would I be trying to be sexy for? Derek? I'm not even sure the man would know sexy if it hit him in the face. So why am I concerned about how he's going to look at me? Oh man, I am in trouble. Derek stands as I hobble into the lobby, and the look of concern all over his face sends my heart two-stepping in my chest. Is it broken? He asks. No, just sprained. The doctor says I should be good to continue our mission on Monday, but I do need to take the weekend to rest and I'm forced to use these. I stare down at the crutches with disdain. Oh, well, that's not so bad, he says, keeping pace with me as I crutch my way out of the ER. Will you need help this weekend? I could probably check in on you if you do. He glances at me, and then his eyes slide away. Is he asking because he wants to help or just to be nice? Thanks, but I'll be fine. I live with my friends, so there will be no shortage of people to help me. Oh, that's good. Is he disappointed? 
And if he is, what does that mean? But we can talk about places to go next week. I say, as he opens the door for me. Plus, we should probably get the site up so we can upload our photos. Maybe you could come help with that? I have no idea if he has any website experience, but two heads are always better than one. I could probably make that work, he says with a smile, and holds my crutches as I maneuver into the car. Getting in and out of a vehicle is suddenly much more complicated than it was this morning. We arrive back at work, and just like last time, he waits until I'm in my car, a feat I thought I'd mastered until I had to do it with crutches. If nothing else, I will say Derek is a gentleman. Then he waves, and I head home. What happened to you? Belle asks as I enter the house. I'm rather glad it's Belle who's home right now. I doubt I would have much sympathy from Charlie, or Hannah, and Piper is just too analytical for me to deal with right now. An unfortunate fall while trying to get a picture, I say, hobbling over to the couch and sinking down. I've only been on crutches for a few hours, and I'm exhausted. There will be a lot of sitting in my weekend. Oh, I've done that. I ruined a perfectly good pair of Jimmy Choo shoes falling in a fountain once. I'm tempted to ask her how she fell in a fountain, but I don't think I can handle it at the moment. So I simply nod. Well, I probably ruined my shoes too, but I'm much more concerned about my ankle. I take my other sock and shoe off and place them on the ground. Now both of my feet are free, but one is still much larger than the other. Do you think you could get me some ice? Absolutely. She rummages in the freezer for a bit and then returns with a Ziploc bag filled with ice and an envelope. This came for you today, too. She hands the envelope to me and places the ice on my ankle. I'm so focused on the envelope that I barely notice the intense cold surrounding my ankle or the front door opening and closing. It is just an envelope, so why does it fill me with such a sense of dread? Oh, I know why. Because it has Adam's name on it. Adam, the man I dated for years in college. Adam, the man who proposed to me. Adam, the man who then left me for another woman who happened to be my friend Amy. Well, ex-friend. And I know she must have dropped this off after seeing me at the museum, because there's no postage on the envelope. I also know what's in it, so why bother opening it at all? Whoa, what happened to you? I glance up to see that Charlie, Hannah, and Piper have entered and are staring at me. I fell trying to get a picture for our app, I say, and now I'm deciding if I should open this or just throw it away. Opening it will make it real, final, the last nail in the coffin, so to speak, and even though I know it will happen anyway, I'm not sure I'm ready to see it in print. What is it? Hannah asks, sitting next to me and peering over my shoulder. I'm fairly certain it's an invitation to Adam and Amy's wedding. We ran into her today. Why would she want her fiancé's ex-girlfriend to come to her wedding? Piper asks. To rub it in, of course, Charlie says with a growl. That's pretty low. You could be wrong, you know. Maybe it's an apology, Belle says. Poor Belle. She is always looking for the rainbow and the pot of gold but it's not there, at least not this time. No, I'm almost positive. I just can't understand why she would even send this to me. She can't imagine I'll go, can she? The woman stole your fiancé, Hannah says. It's clear she has a self-esteem issue, and people like that have a bad habit of wanting to parade what they have and don't really care how they make others feel. But you could turn it back on her. How's that? I turn the envelope over in my hands, wishing I had something else to do to keep them busy. Show up with a hot date, 
that would actually get them both. Adam would see what he's missing, and Amy would be jealous that you landed someone better than Adam. It sounds so simple when Hannah says it, but I don't have Hugh Jackman waiting in the wings or anything. Not even someone close to him. I don't even have a man in the wings, haughty or not. Not sure that would work even if I did have a guy, but I don't. I can't just magic someone up. Maybe they should have looked into a magic boyfriend for me instead of the magic eight ball. Oh, but you do, Charlie says, an evil gleam glistening in her eyes. My eyebrows arch. I'm sorry, do you know something I don't know? Derek, you have Derek. What? No, no way. My voice squeaks, and I try to get it under control. I don't need them to realize that I do find Derek attractive in a weird, stiff sort of way. He's not a hottie. But he could be, Belle says. And as her eyes widen, I know she is picturing the perfect makeover for him. Remember that movie, Can't Buy Me Love? I bet if we changed his clothes and his hair, he would be handsome. No, guys, it would never work. He's so stiff. My throat dries up at the prospect of asking him. I can't take him to the wedding, but the real reason has little to do with him. I thought you said you were seeing a different side to him, Hannah says. A few more dates with you and I bet he'll be perfect. I shake my head. They're not dates. They're... I search for the perfect word. Work outings. Sure they are. She gives me the look that says she believes me about as far as she can throw me. Regardless, a few more outings... She rolls her eyes as she puts air quotes around the word. And he'll be perfect. When's the wedding? My gaze drops back to the envelope. It's such an innocuous little thing. White, with Amy's pretty handwriting and a little gold seal on the back. But it feels like a time bomb just silently ticking away. Until I open it and it blows up in my face. I don't know... It would have to be soon, right? If she dropped off the invitation instead of mailing it. I think you're going to have to open it, Belle says. We need to know how much time we have. Or I just throw it away and pretend it isn't happening, I say. I don't need to attend, especially knowing they just plan to rub my nose in their happiness. But we still need to know, Charlie says. And before I can stop her, she snatches the envelope from my hands and tears it open. Miss Amy Meckler and Mr. Adam Bingle. Bingle? She says, lifting a brow at me. His last name is Bingle? How did I forget this? I shrug. It was never the highlight of the conversation, I guess. Well, I'd say you dodged a bullet already, Hannah says. Can you imagine being Katie Bingle? A tiny chuckle escapes my lips, but inside I'm conflicted. I did at one point imagine being Katie Bingle. For years I had imagined being Katie Bingle. If Adam hadn't shown his true colors and left me, would my friends have hated the last name then? Then Derek's last name pops into my head, and suddenly I'm thinking about Katie Davis, and how much better it sounds than Katie Bingle. Oats and cheese, I have got to get my mind off dating Derek. Anyway, Meckler and Bingle would like to formally invite you to their wedding, February 14th at 6 p.m. Valentine's Day? That's so romantic. Bell sighs before realizing she is not supposed to be happy for them. Sorry, but it is. Valentine's Day is less than two weeks away. There's no way I'm going. My foot probably won't even be 100% by then. What I don't say out loud is there is no way I'll have lost the 15 pounds I gained after Adam broke my heart. Pounds that came on in the form of ice cream consolation, 
but have manifested themselves on my hips and in my face, making it appear rounder than ever before. Pounds that have stubbornly refused to budge, no matter what I've tried. Okay, I haven't tried that hard. I've never taken Charlie up on her offer to personally train me, or stuck to her nutrition plan. But still, there's no way I can get the stubborn pounds off in two weeks. Why not? Derek can be ready in two weeks, Hannah says. I'm almost sure of it. No, he won't. There will be dancing, and we know how that turned out. Plus, I don't know if I'll be able to. I can help him with dancing if he needs it, Charlie says. Since when did you become a dance instructor? Belle asks, clearly confused. Charlie rolls her eyes. I'm not, but I teach people how to move for their bodies, and I teach them confidence. I could teach him. I know it. Charlie, you are great at what you do, I say, twisting my hands in my lap. But there's a big difference between being a dance instructor and a personal trainer. I think back to Pauline and try to imagine Charlie leading a dance class. I can't make the image work in my head. She crosses her arms and frowns. Not as much as you think, but whatever. Guys, I appreciate everything you're doing, but it's just not possible. I'm going to politely decline and move on. Or you could check that you're attending. Mark the most expensive food offered and then not show up, Hannah says. When we all look at her, she shrugs. What? I have a bit of a mean streak when it comes to injustice. I never claim to be perfect. The thought actually lingers in my mind for a minute before I kick it out. I'm not a petty person. Or at least I try not to be. And really, I'm happier without Adam in my life. Sure, I don't know what I want now exactly, but I'm having fun letting fate decide. Wait, why are we even discussing this? Belle asks. Her eyebrow lifts ever so slightly, and the evil gleam that was in Hannah's eyes alights in hers. She glances around at the others, and their expressions adjust to mirror hers. That's right, Hannah says. I do believe there's still a week of the dare left. No, no, they wouldn't. I can't leave this decision up to the magic eight ball. It's served me well, but I just know that this time it will betray me. This time it will tell me that I should go, and then I'll have to. No, guys, come on. I can't let the eight ball decide this. Charlie folds her arms across her chest. A dare is a dare, unless you're backing out of it. I sigh. She knows there is no way I will back out now, but that doesn't make this any easier. Fine, someone get me my bag. It's in there. Belle dutifully scurries over to the table where I dropped my bag when I entered, and returns brandishing the eight ball. Reluctantly, I take it and ask, Should I go to Adam's wedding? I turn the ball over and the words concentrate and ask again float to the top. Well, I guess that's a no, I say relieved. Technically, that's not a no, Piper says. It simply means you have to repeat it. I glare at Piper, annoyed with her rigid attention to detail. I think again about setting her and Derek up. They'd probably get along great. Then I realize I can't set them up because I don't want him to date her. I want him to date me. Okay, shoving that thought away to dissect later. Fine. I close my eyes and ask the question again. This time, my answer is no floats to the top. Ha! See? The eight ball has spoken. I'm not going. So why do I feel a little disappointed at that fact? Chapter 12. Derek. I could have gone home, but I find myself needing to talk to someone about the conflicting feelings waging a war in my chest, and so I point my car toward my best friend's house. Hopefully Tommy won't mind seeing me two days in a week. 
Derek, what a nice surprise, Tommy says as he opens the front door for me. It's nearly dinner time, and I feel a little bad that I'm probably ruining their plans, but Tommy wears his normal smile behind his thick glasses. Thanks for letting me drop in. You're always welcome, you know that. He ushers me inside and toward the kitchen, where Edith is putting some finishing touches on dinner. Edith could never be one of those women who stayed home and cooked all day, but she loves to dress like it's still the 50s. Her hair is rolled into the popular style, and though she isn't wearing shoes currently, the rest of her outfit could have come right off an old movie. I asked her once why she dressed the way she did, and she told me that not only was it comfortable, but that it was her, and she didn't see the need to dress differently for other people. I wish I had her courage. Derek, Edith says with a smile. It's so good to see you. I hope you're hungry. My stomach rumbles as the aroma of her dish reaches my nose, and I realize I haven't had much to eat except ice cream and a bag of chips from the vending machine as I waited for Katie, neither of which were on my eating plan a week ago. But then Katie has managed to throw a lot of things in my life upside down. Thank you, I am. We all take a seat around the table, and after dishing up the food, Tommy turns his focus on me. So I'm assuming your visit tonight has something to do with the promotion and the girl, am I right? There's a girl? Edith asks, interrupting me. Her face has taken on a strange glow, and she exchanges a sly smile with Tommy. Yes, there's a girl, and she is the reason I'm here. She's... I pause as I fumble for the right word. Last week, I would have said crazy, but after spending the last few days with Katie, I'm no longer sure that's the right word. Unpredictable. And that bothers you? Edith sets her fork down and folds her hands under her chin focusing on me as if I'm a patient rather than a friend. Of course it bothers me. It's not rational. It's disorganized. It's... But I trail off because the word I had been about to say was... Fun? She asks as if she's reading my mind. That's what I said, Tommy chimes in, pointing his fork at me. I glare at them both. Chaos, I say instead though fun was exactly what I'd been thinking. Uh-huh, you know it's okay to have fun, Derek. Edith forks a tiny tomato and pops it in her mouth. I know that, but her idea of fun and mine are two very different things. But are they, really? I would never have imagined falling in the ocean to be fun, yet I rather enjoyed it. And painting? That was a joy I might never have tried on my own. Even the photo and the dancing lessons have been enlightening experiences. Are you sure about that? Edith asks. What is that supposed to mean? Of course I know my idea of fun. Edith looks to Tommy, who clears his throat and glances down at his plate, as if gathering his courage. It's just that you were different from the rest of us in high school. What are you talking about? No, I wasn't. I dressed the same. I joined the same clubs. I had the same interests. Tommy takes a bite of his food. I know he's done it to buy himself some thinking time, but I want to smack the food out of his mouth and make him speak. Finally, he swallows. You wore the same type of clothing, and you played a mean game of chess, but your interests weren't really on chess or AV or any of the things the rest of us really enjoyed. I blink at him as if I'm shocked, but deep down, I know he's right. I don't follow. What do you think my interests were then? He lifts an eyebrow at me and sighs. Come on, Derek. I watched you that year we ran lights for the play. You never looked that way when you played chess. And when you finally got a part? I shake my head, cutting him off. That was a mistake, and exactly why things have to be planned, routine. 
This was a subject I didn't want to discuss, but I couldn't just get up and leave. Edith places a hand on my arm. I didn't know her in high school. She and Tommy met in college. But I feel like I've known her forever. She has that way about her. Derek, I know what happened to your parents was awful, but I don't think they'd want you to pretend to be something you're not. You didn't know my parents. They were just like me. They thrived on structure and routine. And if I hadn't been in that play, if I hadn't invited them to come, I can't finish the sentence. They never liked me playing. A silence fills the air as Tommy and Edith exchange glances. Finally, Edith sighs. You're right. I didn't know your parents, and I hope that your perception and memory of them isn't accurate. But even if it is, your parents are gone now. You can't keep living the life they wanted if it's not the life you want. I open my mouth to speak, but pause. Is that what I'm doing? Is that why I'm sleeping through my alarm and why Daring Derek appeared today? I don't know if I even know what I want, I finally say. Then I think it's time you find out, Edith says softly. Chapter 13 Katie I glance at my watch, hoping to come up with some excuse to get my friends out of the house. I love them, but with Derek coming over any minute, I don't want this to turn into an interrogation. Derek doesn't seem to handle new people well anyway, and my friends can certainly be intense. Why do you keep looking at your watch? Hannah asks. Looking up from her dot painting, she has a billion of these things. They look pretty when she's finished, but putting the dots on the page seems mindless to me. She calls it therapeutic, but it is not therapy when I find them stuck to my leg randomly or on the bottom of my feet. No reason. Are you sure you guys want to stay home all day? Just because I have to rest doesn't mean you can't go out and enjoy yourselves. Belle's forehead furrows as she looks outside. It's pouring down rain. What exactly would we do outside? Go to the movies, I suggest, hoping I don't sound too desperate. I much prefer a book, Piper says, glancing up from whatever tome she is currently reading. And I've seen everything in the theater currently that I wanted to, Charlie says. She's furiously scribbling on a notepad, probably working on new ways to torture her clients. How about a coffee, then? I could really use one, and I'll treat. Hannah fixes me with an intense stare. Is there a reason you want us out of the house? No, I say, but the knock sounds just as I get the word out of my mouth. Crap. Are we expecting someone? Bell asks, heading for the door. I sigh. It's Derek. Please be nice. Derek? Hannah has suddenly lost all interest in her dot painting and leans forward like a dog pulling on a leash. And she has that rabid look in her eye that says she'll be analyzing his every word and move to figure out what type he is. Please don't freak him out. I still have to work with him for another week or so. We'll behave, Charlie says, and I shoot her a look full of gratitude. The front door opens and Belle's perky voice carries back to us. Hi, I'm Belle, and you must be Derek. I am. Is Katie here? I can hear the confusion in his voice. He probably thought it would be just the two of us, but alas... With five women in one house, there is almost never a time when one is home alone. In here, I call, waving from the couch. He follows Belle into the room, looking very much like a fish out of water, and also different, though I can't quite put my finger on what it is. I make the introductions as I study him. Same pressed slacks, same button-down shirt, but something is different. Different. 
Derek, this is Charlie, Hannah, Piper, and you already met Belle. Girls, this is Derek, my co-worker. I point to each girl as I make the introductions, but I don't expect him to remember all the names. I was wrong, Belle says, walking around Derek and studying him. He's a much better slate than I thought. I'm talking nine material, maybe ten. What is she talking about? Derek asks, taking a step back. The look of alarm on his face is comical, but laughing would only make the situation worse. Nothing. I shoot Belle a knock-it-off look. Tell me, Derek, Hannah says, joining in. Would you like to dance with Katie again? Would I what? He is sending me SOS signals with his eyes, and I'm trying to help. I really am. But he doesn't understand that Hannah is like a shark who smells blood. Once she senses weakness, she never lets go. Don't mind them. They were just leaving. Right, Charlie? She had said they would behave, but this is not my idea of behaving and I shoot her a look that says it's time to get them out of the room. Right, we were just about to watch a movie, so we'll get out of your hair. It was nice meeting you, Derek. She motions for the others to join her. We're watching a movie? When did we decide this? Belle asks. Can I pick the movie? I don't think I can handle another war movie if you get to choose, Charlie. We are not watching a movie. We're being banned from the room before we ask Derek if he would be Katie's date to the wedding, Hannah says, grabbing her dot painting and shooting a triumphant look at me. Which the eight balls said I don't have to go to, I shoot back, annoyed that she got the question in, even if it wasn't directly. She sticks her tongue out at me, but at least she follows the others out of the room, And then Derek and I are alone. Sorry about my friends, I say, as he sits beside me. They mean well, but sometimes they don't know when to quit. What were they talking about? What wedding? I shake my head, hoping he'll let the subject drop. It's nothing, really. Forget about it. If that's how they treat nothing, then I'm scared to ask what something looks like. Yeah, you really don't want to know. Look, it seems like they're just trying to be good friends. If it's important to you, I'd like to help. I look up at him. You want to help me, even after I tried to kill you this week? To be fair, you tried to kill yourself as well, he says, pointing to my ankle. I suppose that's true, though I definitely wasn't trying to kill myself when I stepped in that water. But I wasn't trying to kill him by making him try new food either. I guess I did. My eyes drop to my hands and my lap, and suddenly I'm picking at my nails. I need a manicure, but in all honesty, I'm trying to avoid the conversation. Really, it's not a big deal. You remember the woman from the museum? The one who stole your fiancé? Okay, it seems a much bigger deal when he looks at me like that. Yeah, well, she dropped off an invitation to their wedding that afternoon. The girls think I should go and bring a hot date to prove I'm over Adam. But the ball said I don't have to, so there's no use discussing it. And they think I could be your hot date? He asks. I know, right? I told them we're just co-workers, and I don't even know if I'll be able to dance. I think we should do it, he says, cutting me off and taking my hands in his. What? I must have heard him wrong. That's the only explanation. Except, is it? Because he's still holding my hands. Are you sure you're Derek? that you haven't been replaced by an alien or something? He chuckles and lets go of my hands to run his hand through his hair. I'm not sure of much of anything right now, to be honest, but she already thinks we're together, so why not? I should be able to think of a million why nots, but for some reason, I'm so focused on the fact that we were holding hands and now aren't, that all I can manage is... 
because it's so unlike you. It's not planned or part of our working together. He folds his hands in his lap and stares at them. For a minute, I think he's regretting throwing his offer out there, but then he looks up at me. Can I tell you something? Okay, I say, but from the serious look on his face, I'm not sure I really want to know. He nods and runs a hand through his hair again, something I have never seen him do before today, and now he's done it twice in five minutes. I'd say it was nerves, but what could he possibly be nervous about? He takes a deep breath. When I was in high school, I was asked to run the lights for a play. I nod, not understanding where this is going. I really enjoyed running the board, but I found myself wanting to be on the stage, to see what it would be like to be someone other than myself for a bit. He chews on his lip, and I want to ask him so many questions. Why did he want to be someone else? What happened next? Why is he telling me this? But for once, I mash my lips together and wait patiently. Or mostly patiently, as my finger has started tapping against my leg. I try to still it, because I can see he needs to take this one step at a time. So the next year, I auditioned, and I got cast. My parents weren't very supportive of anything fanciful like a play, so I waited until opening night to tell them about it. I invited them to come, but they refused, as I expected they would. Derek, I'm so sorry, that's awful. I want to reach out and touch his arm, but something holds me back. Thank you, but that's not the worst part. He takes another long, slow breath. Without telling me, they decided to come to the final performance, but on the way to the theater, they were killed in a car accident. And now I know what was holding me back, and why he seems so nervous. My hand flies to my mouth because I have no words. What do you even say to that? If it hadn't been for that play... For me wanting to act, they'd still be here today. This time, his hand rubs the back of his neck. I think about telling him he doesn't know that, but I imagine others have said the words before me. So I simply place my hand on his arm and say, I'm sorry. He nods. When that happened, I told myself that if I'd just done what they wanted, if I'd stayed structured and scheduled, they wouldn't have been killed. I gave up any thoughts of acting and went back to my routine. I'm not saying I've ever been unstructured. Most of that was instilled by my parents for so long that it is my nature. But I've been denying myself anything that wouldn't fit their definition. I've told myself I was happy, but I don't think I am. His hand covers mine. Spending time with you this week has shown me that I'm not really happy. And after discussing it with my friends and wrestling with it all night, I've decided to stop denying myself the things I enjoy. I like acting, and so if the offer stands, I say we do it. I have a million questions I want to ask about everything he just laid down. How much of his persona is natural, and what parts have been forced? Does he still want to continue in advertising, or is he going to pursue acting? But it is obvious he has said all he is going to on the subject for now. So I swallow my questions down for another time. I don't know. I might not even be able to dance. But there is a part of me that really wants to make Adam jealous. When is the wedding? Valentine's Day. That's a week away. Your ankle will be fine by then, and we can look at the wedding like a celebration for when we win the promotion contest. His words dampen the mood, as we remember that we are in a competition against each other if we win. Slowly, he pulls his hands from mine, but it is clear that something has shifted between us. The question now is, what happens if we actually do win? I table the thought for tonight after Derek's gone, and focus on the time with him instead. Right. Well, we better get to work on this site then so we have something to show them. And so we can beat Mark, 
he says, and I can't help but smile. Chapter 14. Derek. Monday morning rolls around faster than I expected, and I find myself waking up before my alarm clock. I hurry through the shower and breakfast, whistling as I get ready. I can't remember the last time I whistled, but I'm excited to see Katie again. I'm even a little excited to see what she has in store for the day, or what the eight ball might have in store for us. As I grab my keys and coat, I glance around the apartment. It hasn't changed, but I feel like I am changing. Like maybe I have been shutting off a part of myself in order to please my parents. Is daring Derek who I was really meant to be? Who I would have been if my parents hadn't squashed him as a little kid and then been killed in the accident? I shake my head and exit the apartment. Baby steps. There's no need to jump into what-ifs right now. I can take my time. This time when I walk past Shelly, I don't feel the pounding heart or the nerves. I smile at her, tap her desk, and offer her a good morning as I continue past. I even punch the button for the elevator, something I've been avoiding for the last few days, even though maintenance assured me it wouldn't get stuck again. There's a moment of anxiety as the doors close and the car begins its climb, but before it gets too bad, the soft ding fills the air and the door is open. It really is going to be a good day. Katie is not at her desk when I enter the office area, so I sit down at mine and pull out my list. Museum? Check. Historical society? It doesn't sound quite as appealing as it once did, though I'm sure there are tourists who would enjoy it. City Hall? I shake my head as I cross it off the list, as well as the two I had written beneath it. Katie was right. My list is boring. But what would be better? Starting without me? The sound of her voice sends my heart into overdrive, and I turn to see Katie limping my direction, sans crutches. The smile falls from my face as concern takes the wheel. Are you supposed to be walking without your crutches? Easy, Fido. She holds up her hands and smiles. I called the doctor this morning, and he said if the swelling was down, then I could try walking on it. I have the crutches in my car in case it starts hurting too badly. Well, that is a relief, but don't overdo it. I fight the urge to jump to her side and help her into her chair. I don't know what is wrong with me, but ever since this weekend, I find myself wanting to be closer to her, to touch her, to see if her hair is as soft as it looks. I shake my head as I turn back to my list. Must focus. Maybe you can help me come up with activities we can use that won't hurt your ankle too much. Plus, I'm afraid my list is a little boring. She snorts as she scoots her chair closer. You think? Hey, I'm a work in progress. In addition to thinking about Katie, I spent a lot of time this weekend thinking about my life, wondering if I would be different if my parents had encouraged imaginative play more than rigid structure, wondering if I can change now, and if I can, what that means. I didn't arrive at a solid answer, but I'm okay with that. It will take time. We all are, she says, as she grabs my list and begins scanning it. I don't think the historical society is horrible. I know I won't be that enthused, but others might, so it's worth including. But I am glad you crossed off City Hall. I think there's a cool hat store downtown that we could add in, and there are definitely more restaurants and eateries we need to visit and add. As long as we can avoid anything citrus, I say, shaking my head. Definitely. I think we've used up our emergency room visit quota for the year. Oh, and we need to hit the escape room. Do you think you'll be up to walking around if we start at the society and then walk the main street? She smiles at me. I think I can manage it, and if not, I know where I can find some crutches. Let's go then. I grab my coat and lead the way to the parking lot where we stop and grab her crutches before getting in my car and heading downtown. 
I may be taking baby steps, like agreeing to be locked in an escape room despite my minor phobia, but I'm still insisting on being the driver, for now. The historical center is chocked full of interesting facts, but nothing that really jumps out as a draw to get people to come into it, except for the wax figure room. We decide a picture with one of the figures will work for the app, and after snapping one together, which I am minding much less now than a week ago, we make our way to the part of the downtown area where most of the food shops sit. Our first stop is a cupcake shop called Cupcake Cuties. And while I don't usually eat a lot of sweets, I cannot pass up trying one of these delectable desserts, and it does not disappoint. This is amazing, I say as I finish. But what challenge do they do here? Just take a picture with their dessert? That's definitely an option, but we could also ask if they have a dessert of the month, and we could offer extra points if someone tries it. I study her for a moment. It is clear that she has the creative leg up on me. I might be able to organize the presentation, but she is definitely the genius behind this. And right then, I realize that if we win, she should get the promotion. I don't say anything aloud, but I make the decision to tell Philip. After the cupcake shop, we visit a chocolate shop, a cafe for lunch, and finally the hat shop she'd mentioned, Hats Off to You, which has more hats than I've ever seen in one place. Oh my gosh, you have to try this one, she says, handing me a hat in the shape of a giant taco. I still can't put the hat on. The germ thing runs deep. But I do hold it over my head and check the side out in the mirror. It is comical, to say the least, and maybe with a lot of cleaning, I could actually put it on my head if I bought it. We could definitely have a different challenge each month with all of these. She picks up a hat with a turkey head and legs that dangle down. I just can't decide whether we should start with food or holidays. How about both, I say. I'll pose with the taco hat, and you can pose with a holiday hat. That way we can use the picture to showcase all the different options. She snaps her fingers and nods. That is brilliant. Now which holiday hat do I want? As she scans the shelves, I can't help thinking about the upcoming wedding. Katie has turned out to be pretty amazing, and I can't imagine how some guy could dump her for her friend. It's stupid and petty, but I really want to make the guy jealous, and I wonder if I'll be able to pull it off. What? she asks, jarring me back to the present. What what? I ask, wondering if I missed a question. You were staring at me. Do I have something on my face again? She begins wiping at her face, but I shake my head. No, you look fine. More than fine, really. You look great. Beautiful is what I really want to say, but how awkward would that be? We still have to finish the presentation this week, and we work together. Office romances rarely work out for a reason, and I'm still figuring myself out. It wouldn't be fair to drag Katie into my mess. She tilts her head as she studies me, clearly trying to decide if that's all I was going to say. Thankfully, she doesn't push the issue. Well, thank you. You look great as well. How about this one? She holds up a hat in the shape of a big red heart with Cupid on top shooting a bow. It's perfect, I say, and somehow it feels apropos. She pulls her hat on, and I hold mine up. Then we take a picture using the mirror. Okay, hats are done. She looks at her watch. And I think we have just enough time to hit the escape room. Shall we do that and then go back and see about putting the presentation together? I almost say no, because I don't want to think about the presentation being over. I feel like we've become friends, but I don't know how she feels. What if when we finish the presentation, we go back to the way we were before? The thought saddens me immensely, and I push it from my mind. Things are different now. I'm different now, and we don't have to go back. 
Chapter 15 Katie Are you sure you're up for this? Derek asks as we approach the escape room. I know he's worried about my ankle, but it seems to be fine for now. I was careful to have it up all weekend, and I took some Tylenol to manage the slight throbbing I felt at the cupcake shop. Besides, we need to finish with the places and work on putting the presentation together, and there is no way I'm missing the escape room. Absolutely, this is going to be like one big puzzle, and I love puzzles. I used to work jigsaw puzzles with my mother when I was young, and though I have less time for them now, I still enjoy them. I'm not as good at crossword puzzles, but I'll attempt them, and I also like word finds and logic puzzles. If it's a puzzle, there's a pretty big chance I'll enjoy it. You do too, right? Puzzles were actually the one thing we found we agreed on in the very beginning. With a sigh, he pulls open the door. Let's go then. The lobby of the escape room is... different than I expected. The floor looks like paneled wood, but it's a light gray color rather than dark. The walls are also gray with what appears to be some hammered metal effect on them. There's an antique lamppost in the corner and a counter in the middle. And I say counter instead of desk because it seriously looks like a marble slab on top of some corrugated metal. I'm not entirely sure how it's even standing. Behind the counter is a sign that simply says, Escape Room. I feel like they could have been a little more creative with the name, considering the rest of the room. There's also a small shelving unit behind the counter, but it's more like a cubby shelf with boxes filling each square. It seems a little out of place with the rest of the room, but not as out of place as the guy behind the counter. I know it isn't right to judge, but from the ambiance of the room... I was expecting some hipster-looking person with slicked black hair and skinny jeans. Instead, the guy manning the counter looks more like he escaped from Duck Dynasty. He has a long, scraggly beard that's probably never been combed, a trucker hat with a rifle on it, and a red and black checkered flannel shirt. Welcome to the Elite Escape. My name is Joe. Joe. Even his name feels more redneck than hipster. Do you have an appointment? No. Did we need one? I glance around the room, confused, because there is no one else in here. Normally, yes, but it's been a little slow today, so I can sneak you in before I close. I wonder if Joe is teasing us, because I thought the place stayed open until 10. Are you closing early tonight? Your sign says you're open until 10. Normally we are, but there was no one to cover the late afternoon shift. And since we didn't have anyone booked, the manager decided to close until 6 when she can come in and run it. Oh, well, thank you for letting us in. We appreciate it. Joe nods and scratches at his head. Have either of you been here before? No, this is a first time for both of us. All right, you'll need to read over this and leave your phones. Then I can show you the room. He reaches behind the counter and pulls out a single sheet of paper with a list of rules. One, don't break anything. Furniture is not meant to be moved. Two, don't bring any bags or lighters inside. Nothing is to be taken out or burned. Three, don't show up intoxicated. No one likes working a puzzle with a drunk. Four, no phones or cameras are allowed inside. Taking any pictures of the escape room could result in you being banned from future escape rooms. Five, have fun. Derek leans over my shoulder as he reads the list. We have to leave our phone with you? Yep, phone, keys, pins, basically anything you could write with or use to take a picture of. Joe turns and pulls a basket from the out-of-place shelving unit and places it down for us to put our stuff in. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with leaving my phone, Derek says. 
especially if it's just going to be in a box out in the open. It will be fine, I say, putting my hand on his arm. No one messes with the boxes, right? Joe shakes his head. Nope, no one is allowed behind the counter, so the only person touching these boxes is me. So our stuff is safe as long as nothing happens to you, Derek says. Are you even trained in any kind of self-defense in case someone aggressive comes in here? Fun. This is supposed to be fun. I lift my eyebrows to remind him of his desire to not be so structured. With a sigh, Derek pulls out his key and phone and places them in the box. I drop in my purse and phone as well. Joe returns the box to the shelf and makes an exaggerated motion of pushing it in the square. Okay, follow me. He leads us around a corner and down a hallway. The hallway itself is pretty bland, but the doors are anything but. He stops in front of a large metal door with a wheel. It reminds me of a door in a submarine. That's just for decoration, right? I can hear the anxiety in Derek's voice, and when I glance over at him, a tiny bead of sweat is forming on his forehead. Joe shakes his head. Nope, once you go through here, there's no getting out until I let you out. He turns the wheel, and a squeaking sound fills the air. There is a loud click, and then he pulls the door open. The room inside is crammed with a mishmash of things. There are trunks and switches and maps and light bulbs and a host of other items. Now, we usually do groups of six or more, so it's easier to solve all the puzzles. So don't be too upset if you don't make it in time. However, it has been done before, and there are hints available if you get stuck. You'll have to look around to figure out the clues, and you have one hour. Do either of you need to use the bathroom? Because there will be no escape until you get out or the time is up. Derek glances over at me. The bead of sweat is now trailing down the side of his face. And I wonder if he'll have another panic attack like he did in the elevator. I think I will just to be sure, he says. I agree, I say. Partially to make Derek feel better and partially because the last thing I want is to be trapped in the room when the urge hits. Joe points to a pair of normal doors down the hall. Right there. I'll wait for you. When we return, Joe issues us into the room and locks the door. The click of the lock engaging is just as loud inside the room as it was outside. My eyes widen as I take in all the different puzzles. This is so cool. You do realize we are locked in this room, Derek says, staring at the door. Yes, that's what makes it fun. Welcome, escape artists. You have one hour to solve the puzzles. Your time starts now. There is a dinging noise, and then a panel lights up with numbers counting down. See, I say to Derek, we only have an hour. You can do this for an hour, right? He closes his eyes and takes a deep breath. Okay, an hour. I can do this. But where do we start? He crosses to a chest with a combination lock on it. It would take forever to just try random combinations. No, we have to find a clue as to how to start. I begin opening drawers and flipping pages and books. Come on, help me look. What are we looking for, though? I don't know. Keys? Clues? Combination numbers? He sighs. Looking for something without knowing what you're looking for sounds a little insane to me. But it's what makes it fun. He harumphs as he opens a few drawers and then moves to the large map on the wall. Hey, there are some numbers circled on this map. I hurry over and study the map. I bet these are a combination to one of the locks. Come on, pick a lock and try them. He looks at me as if I've lost my mind. Do you even know how many combinations that could still be? Well, it's not going to solve itself, I say, as I hurry to a chest. The numbers don't work on that lock, so I move to the next one, and then the next. 
I'm trying not to get frustrated when the lock clicks open. See, it just takes patience. Inside that chest is a key, and I pull it out and scan the room for a lock it might work on. There are a few padlocks, and I manage to choose the correct one the first time. Inside that chest is a piece of paper with writing, but some of the letters are missing. I scan the paper and realize there are three letters missing. Hey, which numbers correspond to the letters F, I, and P? He thinks for a minute and then rattles them off. Six, nine, and sixteen. Okay, so start trying 6916 on the combination locks. Derek finally looks as if he's getting into this as he hurries around and tries the combination. It worked, he yells as a lock pops open. We continue going back and forth, finding clues and opening locks until a buzzer sounds and a recorded message plays through the room. You have failed. Please exit the room. I'm disappointed that we failed, but I'm ready to get back to the office and put my foot up. The Tylenol has begun to wear off and the throbbing has intensified. I wonder how close we were, Derek says as he turns the door handle. From this side, it's just a metal bar he should be able to push down and then push the door open, but it seems to be kicking his butt. He tries again and even throws his shoulder into it. Uh, Katie, the door isn't opening. What? I hurry over, sure that he's just doing something wrong, but when I push down on the bar, it doesn't open either. Are we stuck in here? He asks, and I can hear the panic coloring his voice. Surely not. Maybe Joe is in the bathroom or just didn't realize our time was up. I'm sure the door will open soon. I'm sure of no such thing, but I don't need a repeat of the elevator incident. I don't have a notebook he can doodle in with me this time. Or food. Or water. Or access to a bathroom. Oh, crap. Even though I went before we started, now that I know I can't go again, I suddenly have the urge to. Since it appears we have time, let's see if we can finish the puzzle. Maybe a distraction will get his mind off the fact that it is entirely possible Joe forgot we were in here. Okay, he says, but I can tell he is worried. We finish finding clues and trying locks, but the fun has left the room. My ankle is aching and I'm thirsty, so I find a spot on the floor where I can lean up against something and I lower myself down. Are you okay? He asks, sitting beside me. Yeah, my ankle is just telling me it's a little angry from all the standing today. We should have done this tomorrow, he says. That would have saved your ankle and kept us from getting left here. I think it's pretty obvious he forgot about us and left. You might be right, I sigh. At least he said the boss would be coming in at six. I check my watch. That's only another few hours. I guess I should have consulted the eight ball for this decision. Then we could have at least blamed it. What is with the eight ball, really? I mean, I know it was a dare, but why? Because of Adam. After he left me, I was pretty convinced that I had lost good decision-making logic. I guess we are similar in that area. I think we're similar in a few other ways as well, I say, turning to face him. My breath catches as I realize just how close our faces are. I can see these tiny swirls of green in Derek's blue irises that I've never noticed before. They kind of remind me of kelp floating in the ocean, but in a good way. I don't know if this is a good idea, he says, obviously reading my mind. We still have to work together. Workplace romances rarely work out. And what if one of us gets the promotion over the other? I think I could handle dating my boss. Like the rogue appendage it is, my hand snakes out and touches Derek's cheek. I always thought his cheeks would be rough due to the chiseled structure of his face, but they aren't. 
They are soft and smooth, and I'm rather surprised Derek hasn't pulled back yet. Aren't you supposed to consult the eight ball for every decision? He asks. I shrug. I don't have it with me, so I guess I don't have to this time. I inch a little closer. I don't want to make the first move, even though Hannah says I like to do things my way, which is true. But in this area, in this instance, I want Derek to move first. Maybe it's my damaged self-esteem that's afraid he'll recoil, or maybe it's the tiny fear that we are too different to make a relationship work, and things will get weird at work. Whatever it is, something keeps me from closing the distance to his lips, but I try to send my best telepathic message to let him know that I want this, that I won't shy away. Then I remember that Derek hasn't always been great with social cues. Great. If he doesn't take this hint, I just look like a weirdo, inches from his face, breathing my haven't-brushed-my-teeth-in-hours breath all over him. So not attractive when you think about it that way. Thankfully, I don't have to think long, because Derek moves. Just a fraction of an inch but it's enough to cause his lips to touch mine and send sparks down my body. I know that sounds cliche, but in this case, it's true. I can feel the hairs on my arm and the back of my neck rise up like tiny soldiers heading into battles. And the only thought in my head is that for someone who hasn't dated much, he sure can kiss. My lips part just the tiniest fraction, but the movement seems to flip a switch in Derek. His hand finds the back of my neck and pulls me closer. I'm not sure a piece of paper could fit between us right now, and I try not to laugh as the image of my eighth-grade dance flashes into my mind. Mrs. O'Toole, perfect name for this teacher, by the way, walked around with a ruler measuring the distance between couples as they danced. Any couple without a full foot between them would be pulled apart. Some kids even claimed she had a cool-off chair she would send them to, but I never saw it. Still, I can't help but think Mrs. O'Toole would be hemming and hawing if she were here now. Or rolling over in her grave, since she's actually probably dead. The woman had to have been in her 80s back then, and that was over a decade ago. My hands move to Derek's neck, and I consider shifting my position to find a way to get even closer, even though I'd practically be in his lap. But at that moment, there is a loud click, and Derek and I jump apart. The door opens, and a woman's gasp fills the room, ending the connection between Derek and me. Oh my goodness, he really did leave you in here. I'm so sorry. Her face reddens, and I can tell that even though she didn't catch us kissing, she suspects we were. I'm only sorry we didn't get to finish the kiss properly, but as Derek's face outreds the woman's, I wonder if there will be a repeat performance. I stand, stretching my sore joints. It's okay, it gave us time to explore. I can't help giggling a little at my double entendre. But we didn't finish in the allotted time, Derek says, as if he feels the need to rat out our loss to the woman. I think that can be our little secret, the woman says. My name is Marla, and I'm the manager here. Joe was called away with an emergency, but I didn't believe him when he said he just left the two of you inside. He will definitely be getting a talking to. I hurried over as quickly as I could, and I'll happily offer you a free visit to come back, you and your friends. I can tell the woman feels bad, and I can't really blame her. What kind of employee runs out and leaves people stranded? I think I have some friends who would be happy to join me again, and I bet Derek here can even scrounge up a few. But we already know how to solve all the puzzles, he says, confused. Why would we come back? Because it's fun. Plus, I turn back to Marla. I imagine you change the room every few months, right? 
She nods as she leads us back to the front. We do, and I will make sure your passes don't expire. Wait, we need to take a picture, I say. Marla looks pained. You can't take a picture in the escape room, but we have a spot where you can take a photo to prove you've been here. I'll even let you hold signs that say you won. She leads us to the lamppost. Let me just grab the signs, she says, hurrying to the counter. After rummaging underneath it for a second, it clearly has more to it on the side we can't see. She comes back with a few handheld signs for us to choose from. I take the one that says we made it out in time because I find it ironic. And Derek grabs one that says smarter than the lock. You guys look perfect, Marla says as she grabs a camera. Now smile. When she's finished, I ask if she will take one with our phones and explain about the scavenger hunt. Her face pales. I'm happy to take the picture and offer a discount, but you won't post that Joe left you, will you? As long as you promise it will never happen again, then no. Marla seems nice, and I would hate to be the reason the escape room goes out of business. She nods emphatically. I promise. I have interviews lined up this week to hire some more employees so we don't get short-staffed again. Thank you for being so understanding. She opens all the boxes until she finds the one holding our stuff. Evidently, Joe wasn't very good at labeling either. Then she places the box on the counter and pulls out our phones. I unlock mine, and she snaps a photo, hands it back, returns the rest of our belongings, and then gives us passes to come again. So, that was different, Derek says as we step back into the sunshine. I take a deep breath of fresh air. Different? That is the word he's choosing? Did he not experience the same kiss I did? Because I'd say mind-blowing, life-altering, amazing. Different bad? I ask, though I'm not really sure I want to hear his answer. Well, I don't consider getting locked in a room a good experience, generally, he says, and my heart falls to the floor. But in this instance, I'll make an exception. He smiles as he grabs my hand, and just like that, I'm on cloud nine again. However, I meant what I said about this possibly making our work environment weird. I mean, do we have to declare this to HR or anything? I smile up at him. We'll figure it out. For now, let's just enjoy it. He brushes a strand of hair behind my ear. That I think I can do. I think he's about to kiss me again when his phone rings. I don't really want him to take the call, but I'm a little unnerved when he merely looks at it and pushes the end call button. I want to believe it's because it's a spam call, but I can't help wondering if he doesn't want to have a conversation with me within hearing distance. It's a stupid insecurity of mine, but it doesn't make it any less real. Telemarketer, I offer, opening the door for him to let me in. No, it was my friend, but I'll call him later. His phone beeps again, alerting him there's now a voicemail. If you want to call him back, I can wait over there for a bit. The offer sounds even lamer coming out of my lips than it did in my head. No, it's fine, really. His phone beeps again and when he grabs it, the vein in his throat pulses. I'm afraid he's about to chuck the phone on the sidewalk, but then his eyes widen. What is it? My friend's wife knows a local director, and she got me an audition for an upcoming play. That's great, right? I want to be supportive, and this sounds like good news, but the look on Derek's face isn't screaming congratulations, or even... Yay? He shakes his head, and I swear there is fear in his eyes when he meets my gaze. I don't know. It's one thing to understand I enjoyed acting. It's another to take the plunge and actually do it. I place my hands on his arms. Look, it's just an audition, right? He nods. 
then just go and see. It's the only way you're going to find out if it's something you really want or just something you've been hanging on to since high school. He takes a deep breath and smiles at me. You're right. His hands find their way to my neck, and my body starts tingling again. I'm glad we got paired together, crazy Katie. Wait, did he just call me crazy? Before I can ask, his lips cover mine, and I realize I don't care. Chapter 16 Katie So wait, he kissed you? Belle squeals as I share the story over dinner that night. Well, we kissed each other, I say, my face heating at the memory. But then the owner returned and we jumped apart when the door opened. That's a little embarrassing, Charlie says, grabbing another carrot from the basket in the middle of the table. Charlie has decided we all need to eat a little healthier, so her dinner tonight consists of salad, a vegetable tray, and chicken. It's a little bland for my tastes, but I didn't have to cook, so that's a plus. Yeah, he was definitely embarrassed. That is understandable, Piper says, scooping up a fork full of salad. Not everyone is comfortable with public displays of affection. I'm not even sure Piper is fond of private displays of affection, but I let her comment go. I thought it might turn things weird, but he kissed me again when we left. And is he a good kisser? Hannah asks, waggling her eyebrows up and down suggestively. You know a lady never kisses and tells. I drop my eyes to my plate. There is a part of me that wants to spill every detail but I have a sneaky suspicion the girls would use it the next time Derek comes over. Good thing you aren't one then, Charlie says with a laugh. Ha ha. I glare at her, but I know the blush on my face has given me away. Oh, this is fantastic, Belle says. Now when you go to the wedding, it won't even be pretend. You'll really be together. The wedding. I'd forgotten all about it, even though it's coming up in a few days. But I no longer feel the need to go. I realize I don't have anything to prove to Adam or Amy, but it will still be fun to arrive with Derek on my arm as an actual couple. And the only thing that will make it even better is if Derek and I win the promotion. The reminder hits then that Derek and I are still competing against each other for this promotion. But I shake the thought away. I'll cross that bridge if we come to it. The next morning, I take extra time getting ready. I want to make sure I look perfect in case Derek wants to kiss me again. And I am rewarded with a wide smile when I pull up a chair next to him. You look great, he whispers before glancing around conspiratorially. Thank you, you do too. In fact, as I look at Derek, I realize not only does he look good, a pretty common occurrence, but he looks different, calmer or something. And then it hits me. He's not wearing a tie, and his top button is undone, giving him a cooler vibe than normal. I like the no tie. His hand flies to his collar and he adjusts it, even though it wasn't out of place. Thanks, I just want this to go well for you. Me? What about you? He shakes his head. I've already talked to Philip. I told him that if we win, you're the one who deserves the promotion. After all, the idea for the scavenger hunt was yours, as well as most of the activities at the venues. Even though that is technically true... I don't feel like I deserve the promotion any more than Derek does. We did it together, as a team. I have no idea if I would have been as creative without him pushing me, and I'm a little worried about what will happen between us if I get the promotion. I would have no problem with him as my boss, but will he feel the same? But what about you? He shrugs and gives me a cautious smile. I decided to go to the audition, so I'll see what happens with that. That's great, Derek. 
I have no idea what him getting cast might mean for us, but I'm happy for him. It is. His smile falters. But there is a downside. I'm about to ask what that is when Mark and Darla pass our desk. It's your turn if you think you still have a chance, Mark says in a taunting voice, and it takes all my restraint not to jump out of my chair and slap the smug grin off his face. Restraint and a little bit of reality. I might like to think I'm tough, but Mark has the muscles to prove he actually goes to the gym. Instead, I mutter, oh, we have a chance, under my breath, as I grab the laptop. Let's go shut him up for good. Katie, before we go, Derek begins, but I cut him off. We'll discuss it more after the presentation, I say. Right now, let's focus on winning. Though he looks like he wants to say more, Derek nods and grabs the booklets of information we put together. Then we head to the conference room. Philip and a few other men are sitting around the large table when we enter. The way they stare up at me makes me feel a little like I'm a contestant on Survivor or some bake-off show. Really, any show where you can be eliminated. A tiny bead of sweat courses down my back. I wonder if these are the other bosses, the ones we never see. And then briefly I wonder what they actually do at the company. But there's no time to dwell on that. Ah, Katie and Derek, how did you guys fare on this challenge? Philip asks. I'm not sure what answer he's looking for, but I don't like the look on his face either. He looks like he's getting entirely too much enjoyment out of this. Like maybe there is no promotion, and this has all been some huge ruse for his amusement. Or that it was real, but he's already chosen his winner, and is only letting us present out of pity. Neither, thought makes me feel good, so I decide to lay it on thick. We got along great. I shoot a look at Derek, hoping he'll back me up. We might have started as opposites, but we learned to work together well, and I'd say we ended up as friends. Or more than friends, but they don't need to know about that. No one in this room needs to know how my knees feel like Jello just thinking about kissing him again. Derek smiles and nods. I would agree. Katie and I see things differently, but her easygoing attitude helped me relax a little and find more enjoyment in life. He flashes me a smile that I swear turns my insides to goo. And she's a creative genius. I open my mouth to protest, but he gives a subtle shake of his head. So I take a deep breath and cue up our presentation. I need to focus on it anyway, instead of the fluttering inside my chest. We decided to come up with the idea of a scavenger hunt app. The city can have the app downloadable for free, and they can advertise that there are prizes and discounts for those who use it. I click a button, and the picture of Derek holding his painted plate fills the screen. I'm almost struck speechless at how much he's changed since then. For example, here at the painted plate, if you incorporate the symbol of the month, in this case the moon, then you are entered into a drawing for a prize. Also, Leslie, the owner there, offered a discount for repeat visitors. At Picture Perfect, I tap the button to advance the slide and smile at Derek and me in costume. I chose my favorite picture. Patrons will get extra points for choosing the era of the month, and the owner Marlene is offering a buy one, get one half off coupon so that people can have two photos in case they can't decide on one. I click the button, and it switches to the photo Derek chose of us. The men chuckle slightly. I continue clicking through the slides and explaining the offer at each place. Beside me, Derek nods and adds a tidbit now and then. This is all very creative, one of the men says. But what if someone doesn't have a phone to download the app? He is older, but I find it hard to believe the man doesn't own a cell phone. His suit looks more expensive than my car. That's okay, Derek says. The city can add a page to their website with the offers, and people can submit a digital picture through email, 
or a regular one through snail mail if they'd like, if anyone still does that. This time I smile at him, surprised by his quick thinking. He said he wasn't good during presentations, but I disagree. Or maybe I really have rubbed off on him, in which case, I can't let him just give me the promotion if we win. And do you have a workup on how much this will cost the city, and where prizes will come from? One of the other men says. It sounds like a nice idea, but it might be too expensive to implement. Actually, we have that for you as well, Derek says and hands each of them the portfolios we put together, while I try to contain my smile. This is where he really shines. He spent hours going through all the possibilities and making sure it was affordable. The men also look impressed, and after flipping through the pages, they look back up at us. Thank you. We'll let you know. It's not quite the reaction I was hoping for, but I still feel like we won. We should go celebrate, I say, as the conference room door closes behind us. We haven't won yet, he says, but we can certainly go celebrate a great presentation. However, I need to talk to you first. The solemn tone of his voice steals a little of my joy. He's not breaking up with me already, is he? Uh Uh-oh, that sounds ominous. Not ominous, exactly, but important. He glances around, as if looking for a place where we can have a private conversation. There aren't many on our floor. Most of us work in cubicles, and the few conference rooms have to be reserved by Philip. The break room? I offer. It has a closing door, though it's rarely used. He thinks for a second and then nods. That should work, as long as no one is in there. Now he really has my curiosity piqued. What could he have to tell me that no one can overhear? The break room is empty when we enter, and though it's not a comforting place for a heart-to-heart with its sterile table and chairs, it is private. Derek closes the door and then turns to face me. I don't think I'll be able to make the wedding, he says. My mouth falls open, and I feel like a fish as I blink stupidly at him. Of all the words I was expecting to come out of his mouth, those aren't even close. Is that all? I'm certainly okay with not going to the wedding, especially since it was his idea to go in the first place. He continues on as if he didn't hear me. It's the audition. My friend Edith says the only time the director could meet with me is on Saturday. I asked her if there was any way to move it, but she said she had to beg to get the director to even give me an audition. Derek, it's fine. I close the distance between us and place my hand on his arm. I don't need to go to the wedding. I've realized I have nothing to prove to Adam or Amy. Besides, the eight ball said I didn't have to go anyway, remember? I know, but I feel awful. I know a way you can make it up to me. I say, as I wrap my arms around his neck. I can literally feel the heat crawl up his neck as he glances around. Okay, but not here. With a laugh, I follow him out of the break room. For the first time since Adam broke my heart, I finally feel like maybe things will turn out all right. Chapter 17. Derek My nerves are racing as I pull into the parking lot of the theater. I haven't been on a stage since high school, and I have no idea how this will go. Will I freeze up? Will daring Derek make his appearance? Will Katie still look at me with that light in her eyes if I totally flop? I take a deep breath and open the door. The foyer reminds me of a woman trying hard to look younger than her age. The walls are painted red and gold, but it comes across brassy rather than upscale. My feet sink into the plush carpet that covers the floor, but there are odd spots where the color is lighter, as if something were spilled and scrubbed too hard, and the ornate doors that lead to the stage look more like sentinels than welcoming portals. A woman, with her hair pulled into a messy bun, looks up at me from behind a counter as I step farther in. 
Can I help you? Her words are friendly, but the smile doesn't reach her tired eyes, and I wonder what I'm getting myself into. My name is Derek. I'm here for an audition. At this, her face lights up, giving me the impression she is only here until I leave, which makes me feel guilty. No doubt she has better plans for her Valentine's Day than waiting on me. Ah, oh, yes, Nicholas is waiting for you. Here's the script. He said you can have a few minutes to look over it before the audition. She hands me some papers stapled together and points down the hallway to a small area with a few chairs. You can sit there and read over the part and I'll come get you in a minute. Thanks. I scan the first sheet of paper as I walk to the chair. The script seems pretty straightforward. From what I can tell, the man is a little neurotic. That part should be easy. The scene is well written and looks like it will be fun. Before I know it, I hear the woman addressing me. He's ready for you now. Nodding, I stand and force myself not to clench the paper in my hands. Just relax. Breathe. You've got this. They're my words, but it's Katie's voice I hear in my head, and I smile. The woman leads me down the hall and to a doorway that leads to the side of the stage. Go ahead and break a leg, she says, using the theater term for good luck. The stage is definitely bigger than the one I acted on in high school, as is the audience section. A table sits in the middle section, about halfway back, and at the table is a man, but he's so far away, I can't see much more about him other than he appears to have a full head of silver hair. Hello, I'm Derek Davis. My voice echoes in the empty area and sounds tinny and nervous. Go ahead and read, Mr. Davis. There is no emotion in the man's tone, and it causes my nerves to bunch in my stomach. Channeling Katie's voice again, I close my eyes, take a deep breath, and begin reading. The first few words are stiff, but then daring Derek takes over and I feel the shift. My voice becomes more confident and the scene just flows. When I'm done, I pause, unsure what to do next. How long have you been acting, Mr. Davis? Oh boy, I didn't know there were going to be questions. Not long, sir. I performed in one play in high school, but then my parents were killed in an automobile accident and acting fell to the back burner. That's not quite the truth since I'm the one who pushed it to the back burner, but I don't feel the need to share the whole story today. Nicholas rises from his seat and begins walking toward the stage, some sort of folder in his hands. I see. Are you available to travel? I suppose that would depend on what you mean, sir. I have a job currently, so I wouldn't be able to pick up and leave without some other sort of income. I should have asked Edith for more details on this. Is this a paying gig? Does that sort of thing exist? Clearly, I should have done more research. He joins me on the stage and hands me the folder. This play is part of our traveling theater group. It will be performed for the next year around the United States. Rehearsals will be here, as will our opening and closing night, but you will have to travel for performances each month once we open. Travel and expenses are part of the salary. Salary? Wait, is he offering me a role? A role that would mean I would have to quit my job and travel? I'm certainly not opposed to traveling, but Katie, what would that mean for the two of us? I take the folder from him and open it, quickly scanning the contents. I'd like to hire you for Joel, he says as I skim. He's not the lead, but his part is fairly large, and if this goes well, I can guarantee you work in the future. So what do you say? Dependable Derek is saying to wait, to take time to think it over and talk about it with Katie. Daring Derek is saying to go for it, that this is the chance I've been waiting for and that Katie will understand. My eyes land on the income, which is more than I'm making now, and I find myself nodding. I say yes. Thank you, sir. A smile lights up his face. Wonderful. I'll have Greta print you off a contract and we'll get you all signed up. 
Signing the contract takes another half hour, but when I walk out of the theater, I feel lighter, like everything is finally falling into place. I check my watch and smile when I realize that while we've missed the wedding, it is still Valentine's Day and I can do something special for Katie. I hurry to my car to go home and change. An hour later, I am showered and dressed in my nicest suit. I brush my hand down my suit and examine every inch of it in the mirror. Old habits die hard, and I want to look perfect when I tell Katie the news. When I am satisfied that my suit is in perfect condition, I flick off the light and head to the front door. Checking my watch to make sure I've got time to stop for flowers, I turn the lights off and lock the door behind me. When I arrive at the flower shop, I realize that I don't really know what kind of flowers Katie likes. I don't even know if she likes flowers. Even more than that, I realize I don't know much about dating, but I want to learn. I want to at least try with Katie. But as I look around at all the flowers, I have no idea what to choose. Something loud and cheerful. A compliment to her personality is all I can think of. If you're here for a Valentine's bouquet, I'm afraid you're a little late, the woman behind the counter says as she enters from a back room. I blink. There are special bouquets for Valentine's Day? I suppose I knew that, but somehow I'd forgotten it or pushed it from my mind. Now I'm wondering if Katie will expect some sort of valentine gift in addition to the flowers. Uh, no, that's okay. I just need a nice bouquet of flowers for a girl I'm dating. Or sort of dating. I realize we haven't really defined what we are, which we should probably do, especially if we plan to keep kissing. And I would really like to keep kissing her. It's sort of an apology for not escorting her to a wedding, and also a thank you for everything. The woman's eyebrow lifts, and she has this look like I grew a second head, or a third eyeball. You need an apology slash thank you bouquet for a girl you may or may not be dating? Okay, it sounds ridiculous when she says it back. I try again. I was supposed to escort her to a wedding, but I had to call it off for an audition. I sigh and stop trying to explain when I realize the woman has no idea what I'm talking about and probably doesn't care. Can you help me pick flowers or not? Sure, but we're fresh out of apology slash thank you bouquets, so I'll have to put something together. I do not miss the sarcasm dripping from her words, but I choose not to let her tone bother me. Today is a good day, maybe a great day, and I'm going to focus on that. Do you have a color preference? I shake my head, not knowing what colors are her favorites. How is it that we've spent so much time together the last two weeks, but I still don't know her favorite color or flower? Oh, right, because I've been too focused on myself. First, it was the promotion. Then it was dealing with the realization I wanted to try acting. Through it all, Katie has been there for me, listening and offering advice without any judgment. Well, that's not entirely true. I'm fairly certain she judged me at the beginning, but I can't blame her for that because I judged her too. Okay, give me a second. She wanders around the store, pulling flowers from different vases and arranging them together. When she's done, she holds it out to me, and I nod in approval. I have no idea if Katie will like it, but I find it visually pleasing. I pay for the flowers and then place them carefully in my car. Thankfully, the woman gave me a cardboard carrier, knowing that I was going to have to drive to get to my destination. When I'm situated, I shoot off a text to Katie, letting her know I'm on my way. I should probably ask if it's okay, but knowing we had original plans of attending the wedding, I figure she won't mind too much if I show up with flowers. When I arrive at Katie's place, I grab the flowers, but as I step out of the car, I hear voices. I made a mistake. I realize that now and I want you back. For a second, I think I must be hearing one of Katie's roommates, but then her voice carries to me. 
Adam, you just called off your wedding. You're not thinking straight. Wait, Adam? The ex? He's here? On Valentine's Day? And he called off his wedding for Katie? I know I should announce my presence or get in my car and drive away, but my feet are frozen to the ground. No, I'm thinking straight for the first time in months, Katie. It's you. I know it is. Please give me one more chance and I'll prove it to you. Katie's sigh is audible, but it's her words that send a dagger to my heart. I'll think about it, Adam. The flowers fall from my fingers, but I don't bother to pick them up. The broken petals resemble my heart right now. She would consider giving him another chance? What does that mean? Was she just using me for the promotion? In a daze, I get back in my car and drive away. The tour for this play cannot start soon enough. Chapter 18 Katie I'm exhausted when I finally get Adam to leave and I sigh as I lean against the closed door. I hope you gave him the riot act, Belle says, shooting daggers at the door. It's read him the riot act, Piper says from the table. Belle flicks a manicured hand. Whatever. Did you tell him to get lost? I wanted to, and I tried, but then he looked at me with those puppy dog eyes, and I... I told him I'd think about it. The girls groan in unison. Katie, I thought we discussed this, Charlie says, grabbing a drink from the fridge. You cannot take the slime ball back, especially when he comes crawling over here on his wedding day, for goodness sake. Plus, aren't you seeing Derek now? Piper asks. I cross to the table and sink down in a free chair. I know, but the words just wouldn't come. I'm not going to date him again, though, I promise. But you're going to have to tell him that, Hannah says. Believe me, not only is he a guy, which means he needs the literal words, but he's also stubborn and you have to be forceful and exact. I drop my head into my hands. I know, and I should have, but I wasn't expecting him to show up. I thought when Derek couldn't go to the wedding that it would be fine. They would get married and forget about me and life would go on. How was I supposed to know he'd walk out on his wedding and show up here? You couldn't have, Belle says, placing a hand on my shoulder in an effort to be supportive. But you could have told him about Derek. That would have shown him. I lift my head. I know, I should have. But I still don't know exactly what Derek and I are. We've kissed a few times, but that's it. We haven't discussed what that means or a future together. I glance at my watch. He hasn't even bothered to call me and tell me how the audition went. It hits me that that's what I'm really upset about. It's almost 8 o'clock at night. His audition should be over, yet he hasn't texted or called. Two weeks ago, I wanted nothing to do with the man, and now I'm upset he hasn't called. Now you're just being a negative ninny, Belle says, sitting in another chair. It's Nancy, Piper says. Who's Nancy? Belle asks. We aren't talking about anyone named Nancy. No, it's... Piper shakes her head, realizing there are just some things you don't bother explaining to Belle. Never mind. Anyway, my grandma always said that anything worth getting is worth going after. You should just call Derek and find out how the audition went. Maybe he hasn't called because it hasn't ended yet. I don't know. How could it be going this long? The audition was three hours ago. Did he tell you how long it might take? Charlie asks. I shake my head as I think back over the conversations we had about the audition. He didn't seem to know much other than when and where to show up. No, I'm not sure he knew. Well, then I'm sure you're worrying for nothing, Charlie says. 
When you talk to him, it will all work itself out. But until then, I say we need to get out of here. It's Valentine's Day after all, and it's quite depressing that none of us have dates. I'm not sure I feel like going out, I say. In fact, I feel like grabbing ice cream and curling up alone with a good book, while I pretend not to obsessively check my phone every few minutes. She checks her watch and smiles. Unfortunately for you, there are four more hours until your challenge ends, so I'm afraid you're going to have to consult the Magic 8-Ball. A frustrated groan spills from my lips. When this day is over, I may just throw that toy out the window and then run it over. Fine. I walk into the living room and pick it up from the coffee table where it's been sitting. Should we go out tonight? I turn the ball over and smile when Don't Count on It appears in the screen. Ha, huh, I win this one. Aw, come on, Katie. It won't be as much fun without you, Belle says, giving me another puppy dog look. I've got to find some way to steel myself against these puppy dog stares. They are going to be my downfall. Fine, I say with a sigh, but don't blame me if I'm not good company. She claps her hands and bounces on her toes, looking a little like a cheerleader who's been told to cheer quietly. As we head out the door, Piper stops and points at something near the end of our drive. What is that? We all move closer, and I realize it's flowers. Or was. They look like they've been run over. I guess someone's Valentine's Day didn't end very well, I say, moving what's left of them with my toe. Who would waste such a pretty bouquet? Belle says sadly. She actually looks pained by the destroyed flowers. Hannah leans closer and plucks something from the destruction. There's a card. We all watch as she pulls the dirty envelope open and pulls out a small white card. Her eyes scan back and forth and then her mouth falls open. What? Charlie asks. What does it say? They were for you, Katie, from Derek. Hannah holds out the card, and I snatch it from her hand, quickly scanning the words. Happy Valentine's Day, Katie. Sorry about the wedding, but I hope these will help make it up to you. Derek. That is so sweet, Belle says, reading over my shoulder. But why would he leave them in the street to be run over instead of bringing them to you? I don't know. And then my eyes widen. Oh, no. What if he heard Adam? The horror I feel inside is mirrored on their faces. What if he heard me say I'd think about giving him another chance? A sick sensation settles in my stomach. Why couldn't I just be stronger and more forceful? Hey, I'm sure he'll understand if you explain what happened, Belle says, but the nibbling of her lip tells me she is sure of no such thing. Yeah, I mean, just call him and explain, Hannah says as I pull out my phone. My fingers shake as I dial Derek's number. Will he accept my explanation? Will he even answer my call? The phone rings in my ear once, then twice, three times, and his voicemail picks up. I listen to his message and then take a deep breath. Derek, it's Katie. I need to explain. Will you call me back? I end the call and stare out at my friends. What do I do now? Chapter 19 Katie My stomach begins doing flip-flops before I even reach the front door of the building. Derek never returned my call, and even though the girls said I shouldn't, I broke down and sent a text as well, which also went unanswered. It is clear that he is angry at me. What isn't clear is if I can fix it. I don't see Derek at his cubicle when I exit the elevator, but that doesn't mean much. He might be in the bathroom or grabbing a coffee or running late. A slight chuckle escapes my lips at that last one. Derek is never late. 
but the chuckle dies when I reach his desk. There's a small box on the desk that holds the few personal items he had. It's woefully empty, him being the neat minimalist he is, but it is there nonetheless. I'm sure I look like an idiot as I stand there stupidly trying to figure out what that means. Is he going through a cleaning phase? Did he get the promotion? At the sound of footsteps, I look up and see Derek approaching. He looks like he's trying to decide if he should talk to me or just leave his few items and bolt. I don't give him the opportunity to choose. What is this? Are you leaving? He clears his throat and glances around. I am. Without even saying goodbye? Look, I know you heard Adam and my horrible response to him, but you have to let me explain. I got the job, he says, holding up his hand and cutting me off. It's a traveling theater company. I'm going to be gone most of the next year, so it doesn't make any sense to start something now, especially when you still have feelings for your ex. My mouth falls open at the cold sterility in his tone. This is worse than the Derek I was originally teamed up with. That guy thought I was crazy, but at least he wasn't heartless. I do not still have feelings for Adam. He surprised me. That's all. You can ask my roommates. I spent the whole day talking about you and wondering about your audition. It doesn't matter now, he says robotically. It's for the best. Best? Who's best? We're good together, Derek. You ground me and... I pause, because I was about to say I loosen you up, but he doesn't look loosened up right now. The shirt is buttoned all the way up again, and the tie has made a comeback appearance. Was I just fooling myself that something was there? Or maybe he was fooling himself? Either way, it is clear his mind is made up, and arguing my case only makes me look pathetic. Maybe you're right, Derek. I hope the job is everything you want it to be. You too, Katie. Good luck. He reaches around me, careful not to touch me, and grabs his box. Then he's gone. Before I can return to my desk, Philip's voice carries across the room. Oh, there you are, Katie. Can you follow me to my office for a minute? I look up at the sound of Philip's voice and nod, but it's automatic. My mind is on the empty desk. When we reach Philip's office, he closes the door behind us and motions me to sit in a chair. I do and wait for him to speak. I'm sure this is about the promotion, but I can't seem to make myself care enough to even ask. The board was very impressed with yours and Derek's presentation, he says, taking his seat on the opposite side of the desk. His desk is big and mahogany and not what I imagined he would pick if he got a choice. Thank you, sir. We worked hard on it. It was obvious. The board decided yours was the winning presentation, which left us with the challenge of deciding who to give the promotion to. Now, I don't know if Derek told you, but he claimed that you were the creative genius behind the idea. I did come up with the idea for the app, sir, but I didn't do it alone. It really was a team project. Even though Derek is leaving and has just stomped all over my heart, I can't bring myself to speak ill of him. Besides, together or not, he did half the work for the presentation. Philip leans back and rubs his chin as he stares at me. That is unfortunate to hear, because we need to know you can push out the same kind of work without Derek. I'm sure I can find a way, sir. We worked well together, but that doesn't mean I couldn't work just as well with someone else. His gaze scans my face for another second. And then he nods and stands, extending his hand. Well then, Katie Malone, we'd like to offer you the position of advertising executive. It is exactly what I thought I wanted for months, but it feels empty without Derek to celebrate with. I fake a smile and shake Philip's hand, but all I want to do is curl up with a pint of ice cream. 
I have a feeling there will be a lot of ice cream in my future. Let me show you to your new office. Philip leads the way to a small office next to the break room, which is about the size of my closet at home without all the clothes. The desk barely fits the room, and the chair can barely wiggle being lodged between the desk and the wall. But it's mine. It has walls and a door and a window, if you can call it that. A postage stamp might be a little bigger. Still, it's not a cubicle. We'll get your nameplate ordered, but until then, feel free to move your stuff in, and congratulations. Philip shakes my hand one more time and then disappears back to his office. I cross to the desk chair and sit down, ignoring the creaking sound it makes with every change of position. That's not obnoxious at all. Then I pull my cell phone out. I can't go get ice cream at the moment, but I can text my friends. Me. I got the job. It doesn't take long for the replies to pour in. What? That's awesome. Congratulations. I knew you would. Me. Yeah, but Derek quit and he broke up with me. What? This time, it's the same response four times. Me. Evidently, the acting gig is with a traveling theater and he's going to be gone most of the year. He said since we would rarely see each other, and I'm obviously still hung up on Adam, that it was better to just end it. Belle, did you explain what happened with Adam? Me, I tried, but he didn't really want to listen. Piper, I'm so sorry, Katie, but maybe it's better this way. Now you can totally focus on the new job without any distraction. Of course this comes from Piper. I had thought that once she started dating Ian, she would understand that removing a guy from your mind isn't as easy as snapping your fingers. Charlie, do you want me to come beat him up for you? Me. No, but it's too late even if I did. He cleared out his desk this morning. Evidently, he had enough vacation time that he could use them to finish out his two weeks. Belle, do you know where his new job is? Me. No, nor do I know where he lives. As I type this, I realize there was still a lot about Derek I didn't know. Maybe this really is for the best. That's what my head says. If only my heart could agree. Chapter 20. Derek. Stop, stop, Nicholas calls, waving his hands. The frustration in his voice is evident, and punctuated with a large sigh. Derek, what is wrong? Where is the character I saw at your audition? Heat flares up my neck as I feel the eyes of the other actors focus on me. I don't know, sir. I'm trying. Not hard enough, he says. Or maybe too hard. Whichever it is, I need you to find the Derek I auditioned, or this isn't going to work. My throat feels like daggers as I try to swallow. He can't fire me now. I already quit my job. I mean, the two weeks aren't actually up yet, but I turned in the notice. I have to make this work. Do you know how to fix this, Derek? I... I do or at least I think I do, but actually doing it is another matter. I've been miserable since I walked away from Katie, but I walked away. Can I really go crawling back and tell her I was wrong? I might. Then I suggest you go and get it taken care of. I'll give you the rest of the day off to figure it out. Be back at rehearsals Monday with the Derek I auditioned, or I'll be forced to use the termination clause in your contract. There was a termination clause in the contract? How did I miss that? It appears I'm going to have to read it a little closer tonight and figure out how to get Katie back or get over her. At this point, I'm not sure which option will be easier. With my face burning in shame, I nod and gather my stuff to leave for the day. I guess I should be glad he didn't fire me on the spot, but the sting of the embarrassment will smart for a while. 
When I reach my car, I open the door and sit inside for a minute. What do I do now? I can't just show up at Katie's house. I'm kind of afraid her friend Charlie would kill me, and she probably wouldn't talk to me if I went to her work. Not that I can blame her. I have no idea how to even begin to try and win her back. But I know someone who does. I point the car toward Tommy and Edith's place. Twenty minutes later, I'm standing on their doorstep, knocking and hoping I haven't used up my friend-in-need quota. I'm definitely going to have to find a way to make up for all the drop-in visits. Hey, Derek, Tommy says, opening the door. What can I do for you? I need help, again. With a smile, he steps back and opens the door wider. Come on in, we'll bring out the Scrabble board and you can tell us all about it. A feeling of relief floods me as I step inside. Tommy knows me so well. He grabs the Scrabble board from the closet and then calls out for Edith to join us. She doesn't always play Scrabble with us, but she's a pretty mean competitor when she does. Tommy hands us each a board, and then we all draw tiles to see who goes first. I grab an E. Go figure. Grabbing the tile with the highest points on it, Tommy earns the right to go first, and carefully picks his seven letters. He stares at them for a moment, then moves them around on his tray. I'm waiting for him to ask me what's going on, but I know better than to distract him while he's thinking. So I wait. Finally, he smiles and lays the word whiz-bang down on the Scrabble board. That's 78 points for me, he says, writing down his total. Then he sets the pen down and gives me his attention. Okay, now tell us what's going on. I shake my head as I search for the right words. I got sent home early from rehearsals today. Evidently, I'm not bringing the Derek I brought to the auditions, and Nicholas isn't pleased. My eyes drop to my tiles as I try to form a word. Scrabble usually relaxes me, but it's not working tonight. My insides still feel like a guitar string pulled too tight, and there's a pounding in my head that is making it impossible for me to come up with any winning words. Do you think maybe that could have something to do with missing Katie? Edith asks, laying down the word quartz. It's only 24 points, but she manages to snag a double word tile, bringing it to 48. She lifts an eyebrow at me and tilts her head. I hate that she is beating me, but even more, I hate that she is right. I sigh as I stare at my letters. Of course it has to do with Katie, but how else was I supposed to take it when she told her ex she'd think about taking him back? Were those her actual words? Edith asks, fixing me with a pointed stare. I don't know if they were the actual words, I say, throwing my hands up. It's been nearly two weeks. I don't remember exactly, but I know he said he wanted her back, and she said she'd think about it. And is she back together with him? I have no idea. Which isn't exactly true. I may not post on social media, but I managed to find Katie's, and I haven't seen a post that she got back together with Adam. And her status still says single. Of course, that could just mean she hasn't updated it. But I doubt it. Edith sighs and shakes her head. You have so much to learn. Saying she would think about it is not the same thing as saying yes. In fact, it sounds more like he was pressuring her and wouldn't take no for an answer. So she copped out and said whatever she could to make him stop. That's a thing? Clearly, I understand women even less than I thought. Of course that's a thing. It's called letting someone down easy. Though it doesn't always work, especially if the guy is stubborn. Most men do it too. They say they'll call a woman and then they don't, hoping she'll either forget or move on. I have never done that, I say, offended at the implication. Me either, Tommy says. That seems like a waste of time. I know you two haven't. She sighs and rolls her eyes. 
but most men do. My point is, it sounds like Katie was trying to let him down easy. I rub my head as I consider her words. She did tell me she didn't have feelings for him any longer. See, but instead of listening to her, you only heard what you wanted to hear and decided cutting her out of your life would be easier. But you don't seem happier to me. In fact, you seem more miserable than I've seen you in a long time. I pick up a tile as I think about my life. My job is better. I really enjoy being on the stage. But the rest of my life does feel empty, in a way it hadn't before Katie upended it. Even if you're right, what do I do about it? I haven't talked to her since I left, and I'm about to go away for several months. I have an idea. I can't guarantee it will work, but if it does, hopefully you'll get your mojo back, knowing you're coming back to something. I look down at the tiles in my tray, though I didn't see it before. There's an H, O, M, and E staring back at me. It's no eight-ball answer, but I'll take it. Well, I have to do something, or Nicholas is going to fire me, so tell me what I need to do. We continue to play as she lays out her idea. It's good, but not foolproof. There's always the chance that Katie won't talk to me or that she'll say no. But it's better than anything I could come up with on my own. I just hope it's enough. Chapter 21. Katie. My phone beeps and I press the lighted button. Yes? I've always had an office phone, but not one that allowed the receptionist downstairs to call me. When you work in the cubicle section, they just send people up and tell them to look for you. Generally, that results in them either wandering the cubicle maze aimlessly or calling out your name and you popping up like a groundhog. I definitely don't miss that. There's a woman here to see you, Miss Ballone. She says her name is Edith. Edith. Edith, where have I heard that name? It sounds vaguely familiar, but I know it's none of my friends. Then it hits me. Edith was one of Derek's friends. What on earth could she want to talk to me about? Send her up. My curiosity gets the better of me, and I take a second to check my hair and makeup. It's stupid, I know. But if she reports back to Derek, I want him to know that I look good that I'm not some slobbery mess without him. Of course, if she could see my freezer full of ice cream and the bowls in my sink, she would know the truth. But thankfully, I can hide it at work. There's a knock on my door, and then a woman who looks like she stepped out of a 50s movie pops her head in. I'm Edith. Do you have a minute? Sure. Come on in. I wave her in and notice she closes the door softly behind her. You don't know me, but I'm Derek's friend. Yeah, I remember him mentioning you. You're the one who got him the audition, right? Her eyes light up. I am. She doesn't say any more, so I skip to the punch. Derek doesn't work here anymore, so I'm not sure what I can do for you. Oh, it's not what you can do for me. I'm actually just the distraction, the Trojan horse, if you will. The what? I'm very confused. The Trojan horse was a bad thing, if memory serves me correctly. Hold on, I'll explain. She steps out of the office, and then the door opens again, and Derek steps in, his hands conspicuously behind his back. At least he has the decency to look contrite. What are you doing here? I can't decide if I'm angry, confused, or happy. I came to talk to you. Sorry about Edith. She thought you might not let me up. She might have been right, but since you're here, I motion with my hand to the folding chair against the wall. Sit. I have something for you first. He brings his hands forward and places a box on my desk. Then he grabs the folding chair and sits. Open it. What is it? I know I shouldn't be scared of a gift, but the man hasn't spoken to me in two weeks, 
So when he shows up with a neatly wrapped box, my first thought is that it's some ruse to poison me or something. Maybe it's finally payback for the food poisoning incident. Open it, he says with a laugh. It's not going to bite you. Are you sure about that? Of course I'm sure. Do you think I would get you something living that would require cleaning up after? He has a point there. Just open it. I'm still wary as I undo the bow and lift the lid off the box slowly. I don't know what I expect to be in the small box. A tiny cobra or maybe a spider? He knows I hate them. But I am not expecting the white circle with the black number eight that stares up at me. I look up at him. Is this some kind of joke? He shrugs. I figured you probably threw the last one out after the challenge ended, so I got you a new one. But you hated the eight ball, I say, pulling it from the box. I didn't actually throw the other one away, though I wanted to. Somehow I couldn't because it reminded me of my time with Derek. So, like a stupid high school note, I shoved it in a box in my closet, wanting it out of sight but not out of my life. This one is special, and I have a question to go with it. What makes it special? I turn it over in my hands. It looks exactly like the other one. I'll tell you in a minute. First, will you forgive me for being stupid? I was wrong and scared, and I should have believed you. The apology is short and simple, but I can see the sincerity in his eyes. Also, a little worry, as if I might not only say no, but kick him out of the office. It's so endearing that I find my anger at him subsiding. After all, the misunderstanding was partly my fault, too. Yeah, you were, but I should have been more forceful with Adam. So yes, I forgive you. Relief floods his face and he smiles. Good. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, will you come to my play when it opens? This time I hesitate. Forgiveness is one thing, but attending his play? I don't know, Derek. I mean, I'm sure you're a good actor, but you haven't spoken to me in weeks. He shakes his head. Sorry, I forgot to add that I dare you to use the ball to answer. My forehead furrows. I don't know where he's going with this, but he knows I can't resist a dare. I wait for him to elaborate, but when he says nothing more, I sigh and ask the ball if I should attend his performance. I turn the ball over and undoubtedly so pops into the screen. Undoubtedly so? I don't remember that being one of the options. His smile widens. Fantastic. I'm glad you'll be attending. He pulls something from his pocket. Here's a ticket for you and one for each of your friends. That's five, right? I didn't include a ticket for dates, though if they have someone, let me know and I'll get you more. This is sweet, Derek, but I don't understand. Why do you even want me to come to your play? Because I was wrong? I'm not very good at this dating thing, Katie, a fact which my friend Edith illuminated for me recently, but I'd really like to try. I'd like a second chance. I don't know, Derek. He cuts me off. You see, I have learned that statement is you trying to let me down easily, which is what you were trying to do with your ex, though I didn't know that at the time. Despite my apprehension, I smile at the glimpse of the old Derek the very analytical one. Okay, that's a good lesson to learn, and your friend Edith is right. Ask the ball, please, he says, cutting me off and pointing at the toy. Ask it if you should give me, give us, a second chance. His eyes are so serious that I feel like I'm getting a glimpse into his soul. Why would I ask it that? You said you're going to be gone for most of the year, and starting a relationship would be a distraction. I'm trying to be strong, but I can hear the slight shake of my voice. Derek comes around the small desk and kneels in front of me. Good gravy. He's not going to propose, is he? Because I've realized in the last few weeks that my life is lonely without you. 
I miss your spontaneity. I miss how you challenge me and how you see the world differently. And I don't think I can go on tour without knowing that I'll be coming back to you. I blink at him as I try to process his words. I don't know what happened to him or what Edith said. I'll have to thank her later. But I feel exactly the same way. My lips curve into a smile as I decide to tease him just slightly. So if I wanted you to stay, then shouldn't I just say no? He places his hands around my hands, covering the ball. Just ask it, please. Fine. Should I be Derek's girlfriend? I turn the ball over and yes, yes, yes fills the screen. I laugh and shake my head. Okay, I know that was not one of the original options. What did you do to this thing? I'm turning it over in my hands when Derek takes the ball from me and places it on the desk. Then he grabs my hands and pulls me up beside him. A magician never reveals his secrets, he says, running his hands up my arms to cup my face. A shiver races down my spine, and that familiar feeling of jello knees takes over. You're not a magician, I manage to whisper. Are you sure about that? He asks, tilting his head, because I'm pretty sure I managed to change your heart. Then, before I can say anything more, he leans forward and claims my lips. He's hesitant at first, but when my arms, those traitors, wind around his neck, he deepens the kiss and pulls me closer. Once again, Mrs. O'Toole must be rolling in her grave, but I don't care, because here in Derek's arms is where I want to be. We're both a little breathless when we finally pull back and Derek smiles as he pushes hair behind my ears. I can't promise I won't mess up again, Katie, but I promise I'll work on communicating better. I really want this to work. Me too, I say, and kiss him again. A light tap on the door pulls us apart, and Edith sticks her head in. Sorry to interrupt, but I think there's about to be a meeting, and I don't want the boss walking in on you. Guess that's my cue. Derek says, placing a final kiss on my lips before pulling back. Dinner tonight? Only if I get to choose, I say with a smile. As long as it's not citrus, I'll let you choose every time, he says. And then he's gone. Edith flashes a thumbs up and then she disappears as well, leaving me alone in my office with a happy heart, tingling lips, and a mysterious eight ball. I turn it over without asking a question, and my sources say yes fills the screen. Then it is decidedly so. Then there's no doubt in my mind. I smile as I set the ball back on the desk. I don't know how he did it, but he rigged this eight ball to always say yes. I'm floating on cloud nine the rest of the day, but when I arrive home that evening, I realize I have to tell my friends and I have no idea how they're going to take the news. Oh, good, you're just in time, Hannah says, as I step through the front door. Just in time for what? I ask, setting my bag on the floor and closing the door behind me. For dinner, we made your favorite, Belle says. Oh, I feel bad that they made my favorite dinner. I should have texted them but I felt this was too big to share over text. I can't stay for dinner. I have plans. What plans? Charlie asks, folding her arms across her chest. Plans with Derek. Then, before they can say anything more, I launch into the story, ending with pulling the new eight ball from my bag. For a moment, there is silence as the girls stare at me and then at each other. I knew it, Hannah says, breaking the silence. Didn't I tell you they'd get back together? Actually, I think my bet is closest, Charlie says. Wait, they were betting on when I'd get back together with Derek? Does this mean we can get rid of all the ice cream in the freezer? Belle asks. No, because I might need it, Piper says, 
louder than everyone else, and we all go silent. Why would you need it, I ask? You rarely eat ice cream. Because I think Ian is breaking up with me, she begins, and we all sit down to listen to her story. My friends might be crazy, but I wouldn't trade them for the world. The End Want to find out what's going on with Piper? Be sure to look for the next book in the series, Spring Into Love, coming soon. And if you missed A Merry Mistake, be sure to grab it to read more about Belle.